Good evening. It being uh, on or about 7 p.m., the planning board meeting um, will come to order. Um, we've got a lot of things to cover tonight, and I know that there are going to be people attending uh, via Zoom as well. So um, whether you have attended a meeting by Zoom or not, I'm just going to request that um, until we're done having some discussion in here and we open it up to Zoom participants, that if you can, keep your microphone off because if your phone rings or your dog barks or your kid comes in, it'll interrupt what's going on in here. We won't be able to, you won't be able to hear us. We won't be able to hear you. So we will give everybody a full ability to participate, I promise. But that's just kind of, I think that's the best thing. And I'm only saying that because I've attended a lot of Zoom meetings in the last eight weeks and that's what I've noticed a lot is that, you know, somebody just, something happens they want to speak you can't speak over each other unfortunately with the technology the way it is so far and, but i promise you we'll give everybody an opportunity to put in their two cents ask questions whatever you need to do this evening maybe a raise of the hands yeah they could raise their hands they could you know whatever that's fine we'll we'll keep an eye on it we'll let mr weber guide <coughs> us through the process so um is there a planner's report diana I didn't have one. You can ask Paige. Paige, do you have a planner's report? I have a planner's report in my head. Well, if it's important and you want to and you want to let us know about it, fine. If you want us to pass by this evening, we can do that too. No, I think I should give you my important news. Okay, then go ahead. Um, I'll be very quick though. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know that at this time we're back in the office um, at a 25% coverage. So that's basically one of us in the office um, during business hours. So that, that's a little bit of an upgrade. You know, that be, should be live phone coverage. Although just be patient because when I'm in there, oftentimes I'm on, like yesterday I was on three meetings at once, which I learned you can't do. Um, <laughs> so when the phone rang, I was really in trouble. Uh, so we are, um, we are back to work a bit. I mean, we've been working from home, but it's nice to be back in the physical space of town hall and have all our files with us and our facilities, printers. Um, so. That's been um, an interesting uh, transition back. Um, right now, the town hall is not open to the public, but so if you want, if folks want to email us or call us, we are certainly willing to work with them to make any arrangements um, for whatever is needed. Um, the reason I did want to make sure I got the word out is that there's a business survey that's um, up on the town's website on the front page. And regardless of the size of your business, we're asking everyone to fill it out, even if you're home occupation. The reason being for that is right now we have the chance to go for funding for some social service money and also for grants to support micro businesses or micro enterprises. Um, those are limited to one to five employees, one of which must be the owner. Um, so obviously that is limited, but that's what's available right now from the federal government. So we wanna grab some for the Foxborough businesses. We're talking, these are grants um, they would be given free money. Um, so we're hoping several thousand dollars, it wouldn't have to be paid back and it might help some of these smaller businesses. But again, the larger ones should fill it out as well because we don't know what, as we go through this recovery effort, we don't know what's going to be offered. So we've collected this data and what we do is we collect it in the aggregate and it's anonymous and this provides justification for certain things we you know some of the questions are have you been impacted have you lost sales have you had to lay off employees so at every level of business whether small or large that would be helpful information to justify further funding efforts so please if anybody's listening friends neighbors you know make sure they get that survey filled in um, we've only had 11 people fill it out and it's been out for a week so 11 entities so it's a real shame because um, this really is helpful information for the community um, and to that point, we are applying for a CBBG grant. Normally those funds are for what's called entitlement communities, though you're more lower income communities. But as a result of the COVID recovery, all communities are eligible. So we are eligible for up to $400,000. So we're not talking a little bit of money, we're talking a good amount. That being said, we probably won't get 400 because we believe that 400 is gonna be uh, restricted to communities like a Chelsea or those that had significant impacts. And these are truly for COVID impacts. But we are being told by our consultant that it might be up to 200,000, 250,000. So Mark Craig would get some of that for social services and then we could offer some to the micro enterprises. So please do fill out the survey. Um, we're continuing to work on the housing plan and the housing advocacy effort. Um, the working group has been very hard at work. Um, 
on the strategies that we're going to be bringing forward towards the latter part of June. We've been talking about an innovative way of doing this, and no one wants to sit on the 90-minute Zoom webinar and hear us tell you about these things, so we're coming up with different ways of doing it, whether it's um, little modules of going over the strategies so and the getting um, opinions at the end of them by the residents that participate. So it might be a great way to actually get some true input from the community. So stay tuned for that. That's the, um, the last two weeks of June. Um, but we do have our next advocacy meeting on housing, and that is a virtual meeting, of course. And it's next, um, it's June 4th. I think that's next Thursday, 6 p.m. Um, call or email the planning office if you need that link, because you do need to pre-register to avoid Zoom bombing. Um, also, we have uh, two openings on the Economic Development Committee. Um, <laughs> So if anybody's interested in that, please get your name in. We have a couple applicants, so not to worry, it will be filled, but if it's something you're passionate about, please let us know. And then lastly, um, we hosted a legislative breakfast. I'm the chair of the TRIC um, subregion of the MAPC, and so we hosted a legislative breakfast last week. Um, our, our representatives attended, Jay Barrows and Paul Feeney, and it was a great, um, chance for us to sit down with all the local legislators and talk about what's going on. Obviously, we spend a lot of time on budget. Town meeting is a major thing that needs to be figured out. Um, but we talked about a whole lot of recovery. So it was a great opportunity to touch base with our local legislators. And they were, as always, they are so helpful and so accessible. Jay Barrows posted it with me. And we had a fabulous turnout. So as always, I'm thankful for that. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Um, anything in interactive subdivisions? Not that I know of, you could ask Gabby. Gab, anything? Active subdivisions, anything? Uh, yeah, no, we don't have anything right now. Uh, the uh, River Ridge is continuing the uh, construction. If you've driven by, you've seen it's very, very active right now. Okay. That's it. All right, very good. I don't, the minutes aren't done yet, so okay. skip those. <laughs> so, you know, we're a little early, but it's an informal discussion. Um, so we have some possible zoning amendments for fall town meeting and barney uh has been gracious enough to attend with us tonight the first one um to discuss is um accessory apartments so we want to talk about and discuss some possible changes that may uh come up um what you hear tonight is just sort of like a, a first pass of things so they may change by the time we get to a town meeting but there has been a lot of um, activity on uh, this, some of it coming from the, the group that's uh, there for affordable housing that, that Paige has been uh, involved with. So we've got a lot of input from them about this. So Barney, is there I don't know if Paige wants to, or, or, yeah, sort either. of an introduction or? Sure, why don't I? And then Barney, I know you'll fill in the, the blanks. Um, so this has come about as we've, as you know, been talking about housing quite a bit lately, um, almost a year now when we held our first housing forum in June. So as a result of that, I have to admit there's been a little bit of housing fatigue. So at our last meeting um, at the senior center of the housing advocacy group, it was really well attended. And um, folks had been, have been very active and participatory and they kind of called for this and they said, can we start on this now? Um, they're just doing minor modifications to our existing family or existing in-law apartment bylaw or accessory apartment bylaw as we call it um and so it was actually through the advocacy group that they said can we take a look at this sooner rather than later rather than waiting till the end of the plan and all the recommendations this was considered low-hanging fruit so that's why we're bringing it forward barney was kind enough and i'll let him explain he does it better but um i know this isn't necessarily his proposal it's more that he heard the group and he um, is sort of qualified at zoning amendments, so he took our existing bylaw and tweaked it, and he'll explain that. But we'll just <clears throat> make it clear, Barney's not necessarily the one pounding the pavement on this. He's just uh, nicely representing our group and what he heard and doing it in a way that we don't end up having to live with bylaws that are um, hard to enforce down the road. So, um, Barney, if you want to okay. pick up. Thank you. So. I don't want to uh, contradict Paige in any fashion, but maybe give a little little nuance to, uh, to everything. Um, I, I asked, you know, I've gone to most of the um, advocacy meetings, as, have, as has Ron, um, and I've heard what people are looking for, as you know, Paige indicated, and I am not here tonight representing the advocacy group. 
Um, I'm not, what I drafted is not on their behalf. I suggested to Paige that I thought I could come up with a good bylaw proposal that would address those kinds of issues and that would also be balanced in the sense that it would not be inimical to the character of the town of Foxborough. And Paige graciously um, allowed me to go forward and that's what, what you have in front of you. I'm, I'm sure that what I drafted, some people are gonna say doesn't do enough and some people are gonna say it goes too far. Um, again, I think it's a balanced, measured approach. Um, certainly, if the direction you want to proceed in is reflective of what I've drafted, um, whatever revisions you want to make, I'd be more than happy you know, to make them. Um, finally, what you see in front of you is structured very much different than what is currently in the, um, in the bylaw, in the zoning bylaw. Um, but much of what is here is current. I may have reworded it differently. Part of that's my own ego. Part of it, it's just easier for me to draft things that way. Um, but much of what is here, and I'll try to point this out as we go along, is current. And obviously, some of it is, is new. But it's a combination of, um, of old and new. Um, some of the substance has changed, but some of the substance is, is the same. And again, I'll try to point, point that out. So first thing I'm doing is saying we, we've got two new bylaw sections, one that deals with accessory apartments and, that will, and a second one that deals with affordable accessory apartments. And in the very, very first paragraph, what you're seeing is that, again, subject to obtaining a special permit from the planning board and subject to fulfilling the requirements that are listed in the proposed bylaw, somebody can request authorization, a special permit, for an accessory apartment. And that accessory apartment, unlike currently, would not be just for a family member, it could be for anybody. In other words, I can construct an accessory apartment in my home, I could be re renting it to any of you, I could be renting it to a family member. Currently, we only allow accessory apartments to be rented to family members. So it's no longer going to be, if, this is, if something of this nature goes through, an in-law apartment. It's going to be basically an apartment. If we go down to item number one, only <coughs> one accessory apartment is permitted on a lot. So a homeowner cannot have two apartments. And the accessory apartment and the principal residence must be owned by the same individual. So the owner cannot be renting one, in other words, the accessory apartment can't be owned by one person, principal residence by another. That's consistent with, um, with what we have at the same time. Item number two is that the owner of the residential structure has to occupy either the accessory apartment or the principal residence. That's comparable to what we uh, require right now. Item number three, the um, principal residence and the accessory apartment will have to be either satisfy applicable dimensional requirements or obtain the appropriate, um, the appropriate per permits or variances. One reason I'm requiring this is, or state, saying that we should require this, is if, if I were to extend my house, just to extend it and need a variance, a side yard variance, why should that be any different if I'm going to extend my house for a to, to construct an accessory apartment. I want them to be treated, treated the same. Any extension that requires a variance, any extension that requires other kinds of dimensional relief would need to ob obtain the appropriate relief, whether it's an accessory apartment or, or an extension of a house. Item number four essentially indicates that the accessory apartment is either to be contained within the principal residential structure itself or as an extension to that residential structure or some combination of the two. Um, the wording at the very end about a common wall and floor ceiling and direct access you know, to the units is comparable to what's in the bylaw at the current time. <laughs> Item number five is consistent with a bylaw provision, a current bylaw provision. I would expect it's consistent with any condition you currently impose relative to accessory apartments. So that shouldn't be viewed as anything that's new. Item number six is a requirement that the accessory apartment not contain more than one bedroom. I thought in drafting this that maybe I should say, well, not more than two, leave it to your discretion. When I looked at some bylaws in other communities, most of them seem to say just one bedroom. I did see two bedrooms in Canton, 
but most seem to say just one bedroom. Because we currently limited to one bedroom because of septic concerns, I felt that we'd best to keep it, keep it the same. That's one thing you may consider. You know, maybe you should have some more flexibility in that regard. Item number seven, and I'm not sure this is the best way to deal with it, but what I'm trying to deal with here is that the accessory apartment not be an Airbnb kind of, um, kind of arrangement. And that's why there's a requirement that the, the rental of the unit be for a specified period of 12 months. Item number eight, um, at the current time, we limit accessory apartments, in-law apartments, to 850 square feet. Uh, one of the um, points that were raised, that have been raised at the um, advocacy meetings is that that's too small. I'm not sure if it's too small. I'm not sure what the right size is. <coughs> In looking at other bylaws, um, I, I had the sense that maybe it would be best to, to um, utilize something that's you know, based on, on square footage. And um, a couple of other towns that I saw were, were doing something of that nature. For example, Canton, lit, Canton limits the size of an accessory department to 30% of the habitable area of the uh, principal residence. Mansfield is comparable to this, 40% of, um, of gross floor area. I'm not sure what the right number is. I just felt that it might be better to have some more flexibility in this provision than to just stay a, a set square footage amount. Do they do they cap that percentage at all based on you know the size of the existing <clears throat> structure? In other words, you know, uh, if you have a three thousand foot house and it's forty percent, it's twelve hundred square feet. And if you have a five thousand square foot house, now all of a sudden it's two thousand feet. So that, that's the sense I get from reading it. Yeah, okay. that's the sense I get from reading it. But I don't know what they do in practice. Okay. Um, an interesting, and I'll try to read this um, exactly as it pair, uh, appears, an interesting way of handling this, if I can find it, is, is how Westwood does it. Um, they say that the floor area of an accessory apartment can't exceed the lesser of 900 square feet or 33% of the floor area of the combined dwelling. And I think what they mean by combined dwelling is yeah. principal plus, plus accessory if there is no change to the footprint of the structure. If there's a change to the footprint, then it's the lesser of 900 square feet or 24% of the combined dwelling. Just sort of food for thought. Right. Um, and, and again, what, I was what I've been thinking of here and why I, I went away from 850 uh, square feet was, say you have a house on a 40,000 square foot lot or a 50,000 square foot lot, they may warrant the bigger apartment, obviously, than a house on a 15,000 square right. foot lot. So it's really just to, to give some flexibility to the, uh, to the applicant. And again, because the apartment would be subject to a special permit, you, know, you would have the, uh, the opportunity to impose conditions to, to restrict size. Um, item number nine is comparable to what we have in the current bylaw. Again, a little bit reworded. Hopefully, it's more clear or cl uh, clearer. Um, item number, <clears throat> 10, oops, 10 is new. Um, what I'm concerned about 10 is having a, um, stairway that appears as a stairway. So the stairway. Stairway. Right. If you have it upstairs, if you have it at your accessory apartment upstairs, the stairway has to be part of the unit itself. Uh, item 11 through 15 are all comparable to what's in the uh, bylaw right now. Again, they're reworded, but, but no change. So any other questions so far? I, I don't know if, how we want to get comments on this, but I, back to the size, I'll just to give the planning board some food for thought, if you want to hear my position on it, is I do like the idea of one bedroom um, and I'll tell you why when I tell you my next point is I, two things, I, I, I do think the 850 square feet is too small based on what we've heard, but I think we should cap it out because I think the whole point to these accessory apartments through this housing project has been to increase housing options. And we have a lot of big homes in Foxborough. I mean, we have plenty of those being built. We have not a lot of small. So what we're trying to do here is create somewhat affordable and when we say affordable we mean it with a small a not regulated affordable but by being small enough that it's going to naturally remain somewhat affordable so i would 
I don't have a, a firm, maybe 1,200 square feet or something, or maybe you do like Westwood said, a max, um, and based on a percentage. But I, I would like to encourage that we stay smaller um, so as to not make these, I wouldn't want a 2,000 square foot apartment. We have plenty of 2,000 square foot houses out there. We're really looking for things that are gonna allow people to get those lower rents or the lower, um, yeah, lower rents really, in my opinion. A little food for thought. Okay. Do I go on or? <laughs> yeah, oh, please. Okay. So what I have down uh, next is something called affordable accessory apartments. So the um, Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development has a program they call the Local Initiative Program. And that's essentially a program that allows municipalities to take the lead on affordable housing. It's, it's sort of the, um, the flip side of, of a comprehensive permit when a developer comes to the municipality and wants to develop affordable housing or, or a uh, development that will have some affordable housing. So the community itself can take the initiative to, um, to grow affordable housing within, uh, within the municipality. And, and essentially what, what that means is that if an, if an accessory apartment meets certain criteria, that apartment will be added to, the, to that community subsidized housing list. So if, for example, I were to construct an accessory apartment, if I meet all the criteria that the state imposes, then the town of Foxborough can, can add that accessory apartment to its subsidized housing list. So the first several items under here are really what I've, I've seen other communities do in order to, um, to address the local house, housing initiative program. Um, and in addition to that, all the other requirements that we impose relative accessory apartments would have to be met. So essentially, you would have to satisfy state requirements for affordability, as well as our local requirements as far as um, an accessory apartment. Frankly, I don't think we'll see very many affordable apartments. If I read the uh, state guidelines correctly, an affordable accessory apartment cannot be rented to a family member. So I would expect that. very, I, and, I may, and I may be reading them incorrectly, but um, I would expect very, very few. <coughs> I, I don't expect that we would get many accessory apartments in general, but I would think we would get fewer that would qualify for affordable. The thought again, though, is if any does meet that, why not add it to our uh, subsidized housing list? Well, the interesting thing, Barney, is that we, we discover these affordable apartments after the fact in many cases. You know, they don't come before us the way they're supposed to and make the application and, mm -hmm. and apply, you know, but then all of a sudden the house will pop up on the market and it says, two kitchens, affordable, you know, <laughs> you know, accessory apartment, you know, yada, yada, yada. And that's how, you know, that's how they come up. Then Bill or somebody in the building department will, will flag it and then there'll be inspection and a question and, you know, um, I don't know how how much enforcement actually goes on, but I know that that's how we find many of them. Then there are, and, and one of the other things that Paige didn't mention is that one of the things that also was driving us to have this conversation was we did get in the past year um, a couple or two, a couple or three people who were building new homes who said, can I do this now? My, my in-laws are gonna move in with me, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my aunt, my uncle, whoever it is, a family member, and I'm building this house can I, I'll, I'll comply with what the bylaw says, but can I just do it? Before it had to be an existing structure, no greater than a certain percentage, had to have the same look, there were all those other things that you already mentioned. So that was kind of driving us also to have a conversation about why wouldn't we allow that? I mean, is there, is there, what, is there a good reason we shouldn't allow someone who wants to you know, build that in their, in their new building plan? Um, so, I think I think we're better off knowing it rather than have somebody just do it and then sort of track it down later on. And, and of course, affordability here isn't me saying it's affordable. Somebody else saying it's affordable. It's the state. It's the state that meets the state requirements, and those requirements would be the same for for a comprehensive permit. Right. And so yeah, you know. So but what I think the public needs to understand is because the, because there are affordable uh, housing communities in the town of Foxborough, and it's based generally on the Boston SMSA, which says that if you are a certain family size up to a certain income, mm -hmm. your rent cannot be greater than X or Y. And as your family grows, 
you know, the number of individuals, parents and children, that the rentable amount of money goes up. The amount, the, the amount that you'd be, uh, you, you could, you could, you could uh, get an apartment for. In many cases, um, in those affordable communities, the rent is still, even though it's quote unquote affordable, it's, it's still, it, it is, it, it's substantial. Right. So people should understand that, that having the capital A affordable is different than possibly what we're talking about here. And, and again, an, an affordable unit, dwelling unit doesn't have to be rental. Um, the Nadia Estates off of Mechanic Street, those are condominiums. So, yes, and I believe and they're, they're considered, not, not all of them, but you know, 20, 20 percent, uh, 25% are considered affordable. And I believe the ones that Joe Lynch did on Community Way are also a similar right. situation. Right, and, and as well as the Highland Ridge right. off of uh, 140. Mm -hmm. So. I think this looks good. I mean, I certainly think it's a great first <laughs> yeah, you know, chance. Absolutely. I think we're going to have to obviously open it up to greater, you know, input mm -hmm. from the community and others, you know, the housing the housing uh, group and see what, see where we are and what's going to happen with it. It's a solid foundation. Yeah, it's a very solid foundation. So, so one question I have, and, and may, perhaps Paige has it as well, um, as far as her advocacy group, you know, meetings, the only people that are aware of this so far are the people who are in this room and, and on Zoom. Right. Um, does Paige say anything to them? Do we provide them with a copy at this point? What? What's your, because we have not done anything of that no, nature I know so that. far. So I don't know, Paige, do you think that we need to have a more formal, greater meeting? Um, I, don't, I don't know when we'll be able to really do that. I mean, I don't know how, if we have 20 people in Zoom, I don't think that's going to be as right. productive as if it was what the standard would be if we had people in the room who could raise their hands and participate. Um, but I'm interested in your point of view about it. I think at this point, um, if Barney and I wanted to get you know your eyes on this and sort of see if any of you fainted at any of these provisions, and since you're all upright, that's a good start. <laughs> um, we, I think the next step maybe is to publicize this just generally, you know, whether we put it on the town website or whatever, and ask for comments. Um, maybe we start that way and just see, you know, if there's sort of what the feedback is. It's a little risky just because I wouldn't want people to read it and not understand the context. And that maybe that's where the advocacy group might come into play, you know, where they can help answer questions. Um, but I think that the most important thing now is to start getting it out into the community and, and to having this conversation. Because, you know, let's be real, there are going to be people. The big question here is whether to open up to non-relatives. And um, in the suburbs, that can often be a big deal. You know, I mean, a lot of people have left the city and they've moved out to the suburbs and they don't want density. And we totally understand that. Um, we, they also, you know, you get concerned about, well, what if my neighbor did it and they had, you know, a couple noisy, you know, millennials living there and they were playing horseshoes and having parties every night. Um, so those are sort of the things you hear of concerns. That said, as Barney and I talked about it um, last week, or, or what, we realized, you know, being attached, especially right now with this first step, being attached to a family home, you're not going to probably like I'm not going to be renting to a group of people that are going to have horseshoe pits out there and whatnot. So it's a lot more managed. And that's where we really don't know that something like this is going to overwhelm the community. In fact, most communities that allow this, they don't see a big change on the dial. Um, but that said, it is an important way, you know, through this housing coalition, we've been hearing that people aren't really fans of, you know, multifamily housing. They want things that blend in the community better. And that's what we're seeing. This is, is it's more of just blended in. If you have a, at a, a house that works or a lot of times like Kevin mentioned these families where you know the the parents are selling off their big house and they have you know maybe a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand they could participate with their child build a new home have a great in-law apartment lived in there for 10 15 years granted that's a related person but again that's all sort of part of this whole program is to give increased housing options so my long answer is I think we get it out there and we start soliciting comments see where we're going, and then we are going to be having a housing forum, and um, we can include some discussion and, and start getting feedback. Uh, Paige, <coughs> a couple of things. I think getting it out there sooner versus later is definitely the right way to go about it. Maybe what we can in, in do is include a summary, just to mm -hmm. put it in, you know, somebody who, who doesn't, an executive summary, yeah. and maybe even, a, you know, um, an FAQ, like an already, here's the questions that we know probably will come to mind from folks that are interested and just preempt that with some answers. One question, and this might be totally out of, out of 
line and not something we can do but we talk about having one bedroom you know could we could we ever limit it within the law to the number of people that could reside in the accessory apartment uh, I don't know the answer to that we we'll have to find that out no, no, good question. Because, good question. because yeah. especially from a, you, you've got the the septic concern. That was going to be my next question. And then you could, I mean, one bedroom. I mean, you know, you could put four people in a bedroom technically. So I'm wondering if there's something we can do with the number of people that can reside in it. But septic design on a that. standard home is based on bedrooms, not on exact body count. Not, right? yeah, not on body count. That's why it would have to be so addressed. That was one of the questions I, was, I had for Barney because under number 15 or 6, 14 or 15 here, they, we, they talk about the zone two and, and the other things about. So if you have a four bedroom home and your system's designed for four bedrooms and you're going to have to go to the, to the, the Board of Health or whomever about the, an additional size, that's going to be, a, you know, to add a fifth bedroom. That's a substantial expense to, you know, to, to, to change your, your septic system. So I think that may limit the number of applications as well, mm. you know. Um, but this is a very good point. Um, the Board of Health um, may have to weigh in on that because I think that I think some of those regulations regarding about how many people can reside you know, in, in a, uh, in a, in a, not in a house, but in apartments may come under their aegis. I don't, I, I think that's where it may lie. I'm not, I'm not positive about that. It's definitely a good point. Cause yeah, you yeah. have, you know, four college students live in one bedroom. Well, or in, or in sleeping bags in the other two rooms that are attached. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So now you can have six, yeah. eight, you know, it's, well, you could also obviously have an apartment with one bedroom and a sort of a living room, and they put a sleep sofa there, and now right. essentially mm -hmm. that's another bedroom. Yes, so. that's very true. Yeah. But, but I think Ron's point is correct. <coughs> Septic system is based on bedrooms. Yes. Yeah. So I think to Kevin's point, I think that we're not going to, you know, unless somebody's septic is oversized for what they have today, you know, how many applications are we really going to end up seeing? I don't know, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, how many do you typically get as far as in-law apartments? In a, in a given year, yeah. a few maybe, two, two or three, two to four. Mm -hmm. I was going to guess five. Yeah, five yeah, maybe. Year. I mean, you know, it's, I think it probably depends on, you know, like I said, that the, there were there were like maybe two or three additional ones that came on this. Can we do it now while we're building the house thing? Right. But you know, I, I, I made the comment when I spoke with uh, <clears throat> Kevin and Paige last weekend that. You know, if, if, if I or somebody in you know, my situation has an elderly parent or elderly par parents, this might, you know, an in-law apartment might be an optimal mm -hmm. way to address their, their living needs, their habitation needs. Yeah. It's something totally different when you consider what the costs are involved for mm -hmm. somebody to say, I want to build an accessory apartment, rent it out because it's a great investment. I've always wanted to be a landlord. You know, I just don't see that happening on a great, to a great extent. <clears throat> Maybe not to a great extent, but I do see it. it it'll happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a financial incentive there. Yeah. Definitely a financial incentive. I mean, I always kind of look at the laws of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, seriously. No, you're right. And, and you know, I just, uh, let me ask a couple, couple of questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on what you've kind of cobbled together here, so, just so I understand, so really under this approach, there would be no sort of uh, it would not be any more favorable to uh, seek to do a conversion for relatives as to unrelated renters is that correct any more favorable in other words it would be the same bar the same threshold mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. correct you wouldn't get any break because you wanted to get your parents in there right I think the only difference might be um, between now and something later is um, an increase in size okay so again um, again now you're limited to 850 square feet if we do something higher whether it's you know percentage wise or square footage wise or some combination um, somebody wanting to build an apartment for parents can now build a bigger you know could under this build a bigger apartment than at, at current time okay so that would be the only the only difference I can think of offhand Un unless we were to say you're allowed to have two bedrooms. And uh, my other question would be related to number seven. And I'm just curious. I'm, I might be missing something. But 
I'd be curious to know how that possibly could be enforced. <coughs> like anything else, really. You know, you, sometimes you just fall into things and learn about them. So now we have the mask face covering police out there, and now we would have the uh, yeah, I, I, non-in-law in -law it, it's, apartment yeah, it's police. It's like Kevin said, you know, people may have in-law apartments. How do you find out about it until they list their house? <clears throat> I mean, I, I have a neighbor who, um, <clears throat> Three, three, three homeowners ago constructed an in-law apartment. They never got a permit for it. Right. Um, I think it came to the town's attention a couple of years ago through an advertisement. That's right. House That's was being sold. But for probably 10 or 15 years, it was an in-law apartment unpermitted. So you so, sort of fall into these things. Um, I think okay. it's better I, well, to have Well, I was just something. curious if there was something I was missing. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, for some people it will be a deterrent that it's, you know, written down and, and a law. And for others, they'll just Please. regard it like they're disregarding it now. Well, it's written yeah, down. But, but I think to Barney's point about the, the borders, you know, it's different. If, some, if your neighbor sees a different car somebody's, every, every yeah, weekend <clears> and, yet, you know, oh, and, I, I you know during, that, during the football yeah. season, as an example, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's Airbnb being their, their place. So the people who uh, got tickets to the game or whatever, they're from mm -hmm. out, of town, out of state, whatever. I think that that would come to light pretty quickly um, as opposed to, well, I don't know who that guy is. Yeah, maybe it's his brother-in-law. Maybe it's just some guy you know, who's, li who's living there. I have a quick question. What about kitchens? In these accessory apartments. Well, they're there. That's yeah, that's part of the things. Of the, they're supposed to be, if the if the family member moves out and it's not, they don't come before us for a new family member to to give. Mm -hmm. it, they're supposed to remove some of the appliances, not all of them. But I don't think they're allowed to stove. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and again, my my neighbor who prior owners ago built an unpermitted accessory apartment when it was found out. Um, they were told to disconnect the stove until they got the permit. Yeah. Okay. Kevin, can I just offer a, a couple of, of one comment? And it's it's based on zoning, and in particular based on use matters associated with zoning. There's use matters where it's a matter of right to do what you want to do. In some of our zones, multifamilies are a prohibitive use. Right. And, and that generally, you know, from my experience in, in doing zoning matters in other towns, that's generally how it works. Your, your largest zone generally prohibits multiple family. The way we have our bylaw today, I think it's only a small jump for a person who lives in the most restrictive zone to go up to an accessory apartment. And I think the neighbors are the best protected because it's a relative. Now, all of a sudden, you're in the most prohibitive zone in town. Multifamilies are not permitted, and yet now you can have a, 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 a multifamily house, and it's a stranger, for lack of a better word. And I think that's a little bit of a jump to take mm -hmm. from the intent of zoning. And, and you know, I've, I've often said in all of these accessory apartments that come in, it's a wonderful social aspect economic, social aspect as people get older, that they can be with a family member. It's a two-way street uh, for the family. <clears throat> but this is a little bit beyond, the, you know, I think this is a jump from conventional zoning to have somebody come in who's not a family member. One man's opinion. And I think we have to answer well, that. As a, it's certainly going to be a topic at town yeah, meeting if and when yeah, this gets it, there. It, 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 as a board, we have to feel comfortable in making that jump. So where just, I think that's an excellent point. Where isn't, where can't multifamily homes go in this town right now? Most everywhere. R15 is alone. Your neighborhood, my neighborhood. Yeah, no, no R40s. General business, I think they're allowed. And so, so in in the um, R15 general business special permit from planning board. Yes. Otherwise, it's it's a no for multifamily. Well, and maybe as we continue to discuss this because I think John's point is concerns valid, valid is do we have to put some restrictions on by zone? Well, well, I mean, that kind of flies <laughs> in the face of it. That's it what that's, does. You know, and then and this is really why, I mean, the very first one that was applied for was a home on South Street. And uh, it was a family, they wanted their the in-laws, their, their parents to move in. Mm -hmm. They stayed there for a year or two, and then they sold the house, and they had to remove the apartment. 
but you know, and, and they haven't all been necessarily for elderly relatives either. There have been some situations where a young couple got married and they couldn't afford to buy their own home and the parents didn't want them in the main part of the house. They wanted them to have some freedom, so they so Kevin, let them, you know. Not to interrupt, but yeah. that is more of the scenario that I would envision happening more than you think. I would too. With this type of scenario, you know, where it's not necessarily an investment property, but if you're out shopping for a house, uh, you know, that'll be in the back of your mind. Now, is this a property that would lend itself to that type of approach, which can supplement my revenue and pay down my mortgage? Just like anyone would do if you lived closer to the city and you had a two family. Mm -hmm. Right, so in the same respect, I'd be concerned about uh, developers, contractors, mm -hmm. buying up houses, knowing they could put an accessory apartment on there and now selling as a two family. Obviously, increased value. Mm, I'm not sure about that. I don't, think, you know, I don't know if yeah. Morgan is a duplex, but no. no. Well, well it's, it's, someone it's, has to live there. Yeah, Remember, one bad. of the homeowners has to live there. So, do we want to open this up to. Uh, can I just say one other oh, yeah, thing? Yeah, please. Yeah, and I will say one thing, and, you know, behalf of uh, the concept mm -hmm. uh, is that certainly in Foxborough, I think over the past maybe 15 years, maybe longer, the traditional concept of a duplex home, like you might see still yeah. uh, from the 60s era down on Beach Street or that type of thing, is just all shot to hell. I mean, because what they really are is two full-size homes attached, <laughs> well, right? Yeah. And I think this would provide some sort of, you know, uh, I don't know, a little bit of a throwback and some sort of scaling to what has really become, you know, uh, I, I even hate to call them duplexes anymore, you know, but I'm still not terribly inclined to be over supportive of this. It, but. You know, I, I think you're going to find a, a, a big variance in opinion on this thing. You know? I mean, to, to go, Jeff, to your point and, and John's, you know, when I said earlier that some people are going to say it's not, it doesn't go far enough. Yeah. Um, and some people are going to say it goes too far. And yeah. I think that's that's yeah. the argument. Yeah. And, and it really, the argument really comes down to is do we want to say that accessory apartments can be more than an in law apartment? Right. You know, forgetting size, forgetting um, number getting, of bedrooms. Any underlying and, zoning. Yeah. I mean, that's a question. Because it, it, you know, to my mind, it's not a two family home. And, and to my mind, it's not a duplex. But it smacks of a two family home because there really are two, two dwellings there. It's not the same as a duplex, which is your traditional two-family home. Correct. Right. But, but. I, I can remember in the 90s, uh, and Canton came in with the zoning, and I brought a lot of those projects in when I was at Norwood Engineering and when I was at Tooby Munson. And the board, it was the Zoning Board of Appeals was the approving authority in Canton. And like us, they were very pleased. That, now, I'm assuming all of us are very pleased when we see these coming in. And I'm also making the assumption that we're pleased because it's a benefit to the family as a family unit. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and that was how they came in originally, and I thought it was a great concept. And, and, and even in the early going, John, when, the, when we first you know, created the bylaw and did it, there were even then people in the neighborhood who said, oh, hey, yeah. listen, I moved into this zone because I didn't want that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we try, and they eventually kind of came along because, you know, listen, you know, it's, so it is, it's, it's, it's his aunt and his uncle. It's his parents. It's whomever. Yeah. You know, it's not like they're, we're not really renting to strangers or how we want to express them. It's not them. a money-making so it, was, it was, you know, it became, it became more acceptable because of that. Yeah. Right. And it was something that all of us are going to face at one time or another or could possibly face, having yes. a relative that needs care or needs to be looked after. Or we may need a live-in babysit. You know, yeah. a lot of us can We've got that vehicle that. in place now. Yeah. Yes, we do. That vehicle is in place as we speak. As an as an in-law apartment, correct. Yes. As an accessory apartment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But this goes a little bit beyond that as far as the rental aspect goes. Uh, Barney, I do have one question. If mm -hmm. we can go back to item eight for a second. I'm sorry. Eight. Uh, eight. 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 Yep. Right. And that was the percentage. Yep. Is there a way that we could finesse this because on the, Kevin was talking about the high end of the spectrum, on the low end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. If you've got somebody that's got a 12, 1400 square foot home, mm -hmm. small little bungalow, 40% of that is a garage mm -hmm. and a small garage. Yeah. 
So I think you know the, that equation isn't going to really work. So, so maybe the um, you know the Westwood example, Westwood. something along that line, okay. the lesser of or the greater of right, right. you know okay. percentage. I, I, let me try to work on something like that. What type of formula could probably be worked out? So one, one other point, one thing that surprised me, and I can't say I looked at 350 municipalities, you know, bylaws. I looked at 405, and I was kind of surprised that, and, and some of them were local towns. I looked at Mansfield, I looked at Canton, I looked at, at Sharon, I looked at Medway, although for a different reason. I looked at Natick because my daughter lives there with her family, and that was so complicated, I said, I'm not going to ask her to build an accessory apartment for me. <laughs> I look at Westwood. I don't know why I look at Westwood, but I looked at Westwood. Um, all of them allow accessory, with the exception of Sharon, unless Sharon does it by rule and regulation or I overlook something, all of them allow this kind of accessory apartment. Sharon lim limits it to, um, you know, to in-law. Mm -hmm. um, Westwood also was interesting because they limit the number they approve in any one year. Oh, really? Really? And it's usually on a first come, first, you know, Hmm. First What's basis. that limit? Do you know? I, I don't. You know, I don't recall. Yeah. I, I don't recall. It might, it might be. It might be based on the number of dwelling units in the community at large, but but there is a. They do cap it uh, on an annual basis. That's, that's but I was kind of surprised of the five or six towns that I looked at that that all of them do allow something of this nature. Um, how extensive it is, I have no idea. Bonnie, on number eight as well, is there anything that would prohibit? The bungalow suggestion that Ron made, if they had a large enough lot, could they call that bungalow the accessory and then add on a 4,000 square foot hmm. addition? Good question. What's to say that that existing has to be the principal? Mm -hmm. Mm. You can write anything into a zoning bylaw, buddy. So you're, you're saying, in other words, you, you, you've got a small house. 1,500 square foot bungalow. They, they increase it. They have four acre lot. Right. They add 3,000 square feet of new principal residence. Well, I, I think two things. Obviously, number one, to increase, you're going to have to get whatever permits you're going to are, are required. Um, number two, if you're going to call one of those units an accessory, you've got to come to the planning board for the you know the special permit for an accessory apartment. So technically, somebody could do it but they'd have to go through the process. Mm -hmm. And you know, practically speaking, that happens all the yeah, time. Right. The only difference is they're just knocking the whole thing down. That's what you do. Yeah. Oh. Right. Yeah, okay. Quick, oh. Easy construction. Right. And meet today's codes. Yeah. Well, let, let me do two things. I'll work on revising something for number eight, and I can talk with, you know, Paige about putting together a summary or, you know, FAQ. So I think I'm, I'm presuming that the bulk of the people who are attending by Zoom are really here more for the outdoor dining thing. So I just, I mean, I don't want to prohibit them from asking a question if they have one, but I think we might want to move move along on this too. What was your next one, Barn? So the next one has to do with, I call it story and stories, but, but building height. And Paige, I don't know if you want to also tee this one up or as to why we're doing this. Sure. Um, although I don't know that I'll be as, yeah. It came to our attention in, within the past year that the way we define, the way our bylaw is written is we have limitations by story and height. And by the way we define a basement, it's considered a story, which by definition it probably shouldn't. But anyway, um, so most of anybody who has like a colonial right now um, pretty much has a three and a half story house which only two and a half stories are allowed so we're trying to rectify this that draw, drew to us to the issue of stories and um barney being our zoning guru dug into that for us and has made a recommendation on how to clean up this whole thing stories run throughout the whole zoning bylaw and basically the whole thing is wrong based on the whole basement thing so um barney take it away so several months ago i <laughs> I, I said to Paige, I've got nothing to do every <laughs> time. Anything you need for me to do? And she says, yeah, You're walking around take, town. take a look at this. <laughs> yeah. I'm busier now than I was several months ago. But um, So she said, take a look at this. So, um, and, and Paige and I also talked with our former building commissioner, with, with Nick Riccio, about it. And we decided that you know, maybe the best thing is to forget about stories and just use building height you know, in, instead. Um, so what I did was I went through the bylaw. 
uh, page by page to try to find out every section that you utilize the word story or stories. And then I asked Diana to do a word search, and she picked up a few that I missed. And then fortunately, Gabby, after I had drafted something, picked up some other ones that Diana and I had missed. But, but essentially what you have in front of you is a proposal that would eliminate the word story or stories and just use height, use feet, as far as, um, as building height. And, and these are, as far as we know, all the section in the bylaw that would be, um, would be impacted. Um, one thing I did not do was to see what other towns are doing in this regard. Uh, you know, when I was looking for bylaw provisions or bylaw suggestions on the affordable housing issue, I might have tried to see what other towns were doing here and there, but um, I, I don't have a good feel as to um, what other communities are doing in, in this regard. So, Barn, this is kind of, uh, it's simple, but it's complicated. Yeah. Can, can, we do, can, can we do something with this and not do this this evening? Can we move yeah. past by this and we'll come back? Yep. Yeah. Let, me, let me just make a couple points, though. Yes, please. Um, you know, as Paige indicated, so my next door neighbor has a garrison colonial. You know, basement, first floor where the living room, kitchen, dining room is, bedrooms upstairs. So right, right away, you've got three floors, three stories. Um, technically, the way the bylaw reads is non-conforming. Now, it's a pre-existing non-conforming use, no problem. If for any reason they wanted it to go up, they would need a variance. If somebody were to now come to you, or come to the building department, want to construct a, a garrison colonial, same issue. Mm -hmm. But not a, obviously a you know, pre-existing non-conforming use. So that, that's really what we're trying to, uh, okay. to address here. Creating the basement as a story, yeah. okay. All right, we, we will review this in more detail. Thank you, Barney. Future. Thank you. Good Thanks, Barney, I appreciate everything. Thank you, very good job. So it being sometime past 7.30 p.m., we do have an informal discussion for outdoor dining regulations. Um, along with the Board of Selectmen, a joint discussion with them regarding temporary regulations to assist local restaurants during the COVID-19 recovery. And just so everybody understands, th this board, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that other boards as well, would like to allow the restaurants to implement outdoor seating in response to the ongoing uh, pandemic. The move is an effort to help local eateries return to business. Um, although they'll need to adhere to strict social distancing guidelines once permitted by the state to reopen. Patios and outdoor seating will allow restaurants to serve more customers, even as their indoor capacities are reduced to comply with physical distancing rules. Foxborough's restaurants are a vital small business that employ hundreds of workers, and we need to do everything we can to support them. So we thought we might use this um, as a way to begin the discussion for how we can uh, assist our neighbors who own these businesses and our neighbors who are employed by these businesses and sort of uh, see if we can't uh, come up with some things locally that will tie into whatever the governor plans on doing, get the Board of Selectmen involved and the other uh, boards that are going to need to have uh, a point of view about it, Board of Health and others who are going to have some, some serious say-so on how we make that work. and. Uh, help everybody out, because I'm sure the residents would love to be able to go and have a meal out as well. So, um, Paige, do you want to get us started off on this thing? I sure do. Okay. So I'm hoping um, that everybody has the latest draft in front of them. I sent out one late today. I apologize for that, but Ron and I were discussing it as late as this afternoon and really wanted to make sure we get some Good best management practices in this, just because you know if we if we do roll it out, it will obviously move quickly, and it, we want to make sure that we think of things up front so that there's not a lot of guesswork. So what we did is um, much like Barney does, we we start looking at what other folks have done. Um, I'll say that other states are way ahead of us on this. Um, when I started googling, I was amazed at what's going on in other states um, with respect to. Um, enabling legislation and that's one thing we're, we're hoping that there would be some sort of executive order that would make this easier because one thing I want to say is that zoning is not suspended during this COVID crisis so we are working within the confines of the existing zoning um, but, but trying to be as flexible as possible and anybody who knows zoning knows that flexibility is not something you find in zoning 
So to move this along, um, the purpose of this discussion is to create a bylaw or a, a sort of regulation or guideline. Um, I've labeled it temporary outdoor dining areas. Um, right now I have it as a, a board of selectmen policy um, that would go into a place for this summer. So it truly is something for a, almost a quick and dirty way to get restaurants to be able to use uh, non-conventional spaces for outdoor dining. We do not anticipate that you know these restaurants are going to be at full capacity this summer, and we want to try to give it ability for them to use some of the spaces. When we first started talking about it, we were thinking of um, areas like parking lots. You know, if you're not using all your parking spaces for parking because you can't fill your seats, then maybe you can um, cordon off areas or create dining areas outside. That's what we've been seeing in other communities, like New Hampshire um, is doing that already as well. Um, so that was sort of the plan. And um, we did take a look at other bylaw or other regulations. The town of Norwood's moving quickly on this. I put a, a call out on my planner's listserv. Um, our regional planning agency had some recommendations. So we've been really compiling a really good document of sort of the best management practices. Um, to go through it, I mean, you basically would have to be a restaurant right now. You'd have, you'd have to have a common victualers license in place. Um, they couldn't have indoor and outdoor seating combined to exceed what was already approved because, you know, we approved something under a maximum amount. Um, the new addition here is number three. We, um, this would make sure that um, the outdoor dining area is delineated. You don't want it to creep out. Um, and if there's a point when liquor is allowed, I should explain that. Right now, um, we at the local level don't have control over alcohol outside. That's a state regulation. Uh, Paul Feeney, and I believe Jay Barros has also joined along, has filed legislation to try to bring these outdoor dining liquor licenses to the local level only. Because our understanding is that to do something like this would take upwards of 90 days prior to COVID to get an outdoor dining area inspected. Um, obviously, that would not help any of our folks. So we really want to um, encourage this to move quickly. Um, hopefully that will happen, but as we all know with liquor licenses, they're very restrictive and you need to have certain areas designated. So that's why we think it's very important to have a designated outdoor dining area so there's no creep. Um, we did one of this addition here is about um, sort of aesthetics. I saw some horrible pictures of, um, you know, chain link fencing or um, sort of tacky uh, chicken wire or plastic fencing we while it might be temporary and we certainly don't want to, to break the bank on this we don't want it to be you know orange construction fence or you know in a parking lot necessarily i don't think that's what we're looking for up to you on that obviously that's uh that's just a suggestion on my end um then i don't Going through this, it would be um, access, you know, outdoor tables and chairs must not, must not block access or restrict access. Um, access and egress would have to meet the fire department. And these are all kind of no brainers. We cannot circumvent fire and life safety issues. Just like I should note that we can't circumvent the Board of Health. Um, we do have a member on the Board of Health on this meeting. He was kind enough to join in. We've been trying to keep in it from inundating the Board of Health because you know we know they have their hands full right now and we're all waiting for guidelines from the state on this. Um, so we're trying to focus truly on the layout and the design aspects because we know the Board of Health is going to have to deal with all the things about separation and, and hygiene and different things. So we don't want to step on their toes um, and we wanted to kind of get this in a clean state to bring it to them. Um, but thankfully Eric was willing to join this meeting to at least listen in and if he hears anything offensive or out of line let us know um tents we talk we address tents that's all based on permits and fire safety um right now i do have uh provisions that says heaters of any kind shall not be used under tents or umbrellas i took that out this afternoon then i put it back in i don't want to over regulate and i don't know if that's something i need to say or if that's something that the fire department and the and the building department would handle on their own whether it's written here or not so that's just one of those things that i don't want to Ron pointed out how long it is. That might be extra. They are going to have to still meet life safety requirements and Americans with Disability Act requirements. Um, we have here an important note, the business owner, um, if they're not the property owner, they need to get evidence that the property owner is okay. We do have some restaurants that rent um, in a multi-area and they might have a common parking lot. So there would need to be some agreement um, between the landlord and um, uh, 
next thing is has to do with an adjacent business. You know, we want to make sure that a restaurant doesn't go and put a, um, you know, a restaurant area right in front of the entrance to a retail area next to them. Um, one addition from today had to do with cleanliness and debris. So we um, establishments would be required to pick up debris, sweep, wash the designated dining area at end of each business day, and they must collect their own trash and receptacles. That's because we want to make sure it doesn't end up, you know, leading to um, litter and just sort of a mess in the community. Um, no smoking. I'm sure the Board of Health would do this anyway, but just to be clear, no smoking, including e-cigarettes, no pets except service animals. You have to wear shoes and shor shorts. Yeah, and I might not short shoes and shirts. Um, so those again might be a little bit in the Board of Health area. I don't know if we need those, but I found them um, online and I wanted to make sure we were covering as much as we could. Um, we would allow parking spaces to be used for dining tables, but there must be a physical barrier or separation to protect the customer from vehicles, traffic, such as ballers and planting ball boxes. Um, we would not require additional parking and the reason for that is that they wouldn't be able to use the full space within the building already. So we believe that would offset because again, they can't have more no seats than the original number. That means the parking would work. There might be a slight diminution, but um, we think we can work around that. You can't chain furniture and stuff outside to public property, trees or posts. Um, all alcohol would have to be in compliance with state laws. All food prep is per health department. Um, this is another one, it might be Board of Health area, but outdoor dining areas may only be used for sit down dining or customer pickup and carry out service. They cannot be used for standing areas as these would promote congregating, cannot be used for yard games or other similar activities that would encourage people to congregate or share equipment. So I, we don't envision this to be a major outdoor entertainment venue um, right now. The next thing says no live entertainment unless otherwise allowed under an existing dining permit. Again, if someone feels differently about these, you guys certainly have the ability to change this um, if you think outdoor entertainment. We are proposing no fee on this. Um, again, that's just a small nod toward the financial hardship. Um, we might need to file some fees, you know, I don't know about like inspections and fire those, but I think, I don't think we would want to have a fee for the outdoor dining. And most of the communities I've looked at have had the same. I did throw hours in operation out there. I don't know if that's something we want to regulate blanket wise or if, you know, if anybody has changes. And um, then we did add this provision that if you already have an outdoor dining area permit and you're not going to exchange it or modify it, you just go through the Board of Health because we don't want to make it more onerous for anybody who's already doing this. Um, the process. So then um, a site plan sketch to scale would be required. Um, talking about all the improvements that would be there, it, it would show um, some other important areas, and again, this might be Board of Health area, but it talks about pathways of the wait staff and um, to the kitchen. You have to look into things like how um, guests are going to use restrooms. Um, so there's just a lot of, um, we want to have a lot of information on there so that the Board of Health and others can truly evaluate whether this is going to be safe. Um, you have to show areas of curbside delivery. Um, we reference that they have to do all social distancing, mention the thing. There's some insurance requirements. Again, um, input welcome. I took this from the town of Norwood. Um, it's a million dollars. I did see one other community had half a million. I don't know myself whether this is onerous, overly onerous or not. Um, input is welcome. Now approval. This is a conversation area of like who is going to approve this. Um, I wanted to say the building inspector slash commissioner, but we don't have one right now. I mean, we have Bill, but poor Bill is, you know, trying to get out of town. So that would have been my first choice. I also would actually love to put it on the board of health, but um, I feel bad about that because I don't think they need any more review things. So um, the town of Norwood is doing it through their town manager. Um, that said, it's not like the town manager would do it on his own. He would have to um, get input from all the departments um, before being able to issue almost an administrative permit slash license. So what I've done is broken this down into two tiers. And I don't know if we want to take on tier two or not, but I did put it in there for discussion. Tier one is um, where the expansion would occur on the property, private property, basically in a parking lot or adjacent to a restaurant on private land. Um, in this instance, we're recommending it go through uh, you come to the planning department, it would go to inspections, fire, police, and health. 
um, the review and sign off. At that point, if everybody signs off, the town manager would be able to issue a license slash permit. Um, the second tier is discretionary. And this one would be a little more review because other communities have been doing a lot of um, efforts of using existing sidewalks, streets, or public parking lots. Again, maybe we don't want to jump in this to the next into this tonight because I haven't even had anyone approach me on this, but some businesses don't have the ability, you know, some restaurants I can think of don't have their own parking. Right. They don't have any area really. So a sidewalk might help them out. Um, and this one, I, I, I didn't get as far on, you know, the elaborate of how the criteria would be or how the board of selectmen, I made the public, the board of selectmen, the permit granting authority, and it would require a public hearing just because it would be, um, using public property. That said, that doesn't seem very um, streamlined or user friendly, um, but I kind of wanted to see, you know, we weren't talking about that and I kind of wanted to get the, the, the feel of the group before I went wasted too much time on that aspect. But like I said, the town of North Attleboro are doing that. They're actually closing streets and they're going to have dining areas out on their public streets. We're seeing it down on the Cape. We're seeing it on in the, on the vineyard. Um, we're actually like Friday and Saturday night, certain areas are being closed off. So these are the types of things we might want to start talking about. You know, let's get this low hanging fruit of the private property dress, but do we also want to take a look at um, activating public areas? Um, and then the next question would be after this is, do we want to help retail out? You know, do they, we want to allow some retail to move out into public areas. But for right now, for tonight, I suggest we stay on tier one and focus on how to get this through and, and how to get on the books. Okay, well, anybody in the board who has questions right now? If you do, please do. Well, I would just say, uh, Paige, you know, in terms of moving forward with this, I would just suggest to be guided, you know, you're calling this a temporary application or a temporary permit and there's really kind of two kinds of temporary permits one would be like seasonal which would recur presumably year in and year out in warm weather months and you could ramp up to it but if you really kind of what the objective is here to provide some relief under current circumstances for existing businesses asap then i think the kind of timelines that would be practical under the discretionary tier aren't going to cut it. I mean, you're not going to push anything through until August or September un under what you would look at there. So that might be fine if businesses were envisioning well in the summer of 2021 when the warm weather comes, I'd like to be able to do something like this and I can start thinking about it in February or March. But if the real objective is to provide that kind of relief, I, I think we have to streamline this a little bit and certainly, you know, look at tier one or the first part, you know, as the primary approval mechanism. And, and I guess one question I have, Paige, is, is, at, is there a point at which it ends? And let's say, let's, let's say the governor says, well, restaurants can open interior at 25% for a certain amount of weeks. Then they can go to 50 percent. Is there a point where you'd say, well, once they hit 75 percent or 50 percent, whatever that number is, that the outdoor thing stops or does it get to continue as well? Um, well, two things. One, just for clarification, I should have mentioned that we do have a deadline of this expiring um, in September of 2020. I mean, obviously, that's open to um, discussion on what the date, but we we're trying to find a, you know, a fall date that it would end. So it would only be this summer to Jeff's point. So you're absolutely right. We need to move more, more quickly if it's going to really make sense for tier two. Yes. Um, Kevin, back to your question. I think that might end up being a, an option. The business is going to have to make that decision because they're limited to the number of um, seats indoor and out as the total. So oh, good point. I think it's going to come down to a calculus of, you know, what risk, how many people are willing to sit inside and or, you know, how it all how it's all working out for them. They're going to have to give up their temporary outdoor if they start, you know, exceeding. They only get certain number of spaces. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, Paige. Doc. I don't know. if. Uh, um, and really, uh, from a uh, streamlined point of view, not that I want to take anything off of our slate, uh, but we only meet every two weeks. So I think tier one with Bill uh, having the ability to more quickly approve it 
might be a better streamlined way to do it Agreed. to get it done faster. Yes. Yep. I think that's a good point. I have a question for you, Paige. Um, one thing that I'd like to see, I'd um, potentially put in here is no outdoor bars. Like okay. they would have to, like they're not gonna put a portable bar outside. It kind of goes to like the not standing around thing in yeah. the lawn games. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Point. Right, well one of the governor's criteria in moving forward is no bars open at this point in time because they don't want the No, 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 what I mean oh, no, though no. is like, right. you, you like I'm just gonna bar. use Union Star because right. you folks are on the thing, to bringing, up, setting up a temporary bar. Right, well that's what I'm saying, outside. even a service bar outside would qualify as a gathering area. At Do this we point, have? I think. Do we have any sense for when and if the governor is going to issue any type of edict, you know, a uh, uh, executive order? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. I assume Feeney and Barrows and others are advocating for that at the state house. Yeah. Yes. And we've been telling everybody, you know, our, at the, you know, friends at the craft group too, saying, Hey, if you have any connections at the governor level, you know, this needs help because it really you know other states have done this where they've done an executive order authorizing this outdoor dining at a state level and that is the way to do it mm -hmm. it cuts through all of this red tape and allows the liquor license aspect so that would really help things but absent that this is what we're we're dealing with um back to the tier two thing um so would i read that to be that i guess i put that in out of fear that people would have fear of using sidewalks and or um um, public spaces. Do you then feel that that's not as a big of a deal, and that perhaps this is something that could be done? Um, well, it, it seems it seems a tad um, unfair because if someone happens to have a piece of a, a piece of lawn or a parking lot that belongs to them that they that they have a, an access quickly to approval, where somebody, uh, let's say, a restaurant on Central Street, uh, you know, who probably really can't put out seats right on the street there, but has a big parking lot behind them, might be restricted because it's a public parking area. <laughs> so I think we have to kind of figure out a way to make an accommodation because those guys are suffering in the same way that any other restaurant is right now. So I don't know, I don't know the answer, but I think that, I think we have to try to make it more equivalent. Right, specifically, you know, the House of Pizza. Right. And, 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 and the other one too. Uh, the other you've got the, the commons. commons. You've got the commons. Right. Yeah. You've got yeah. the bagel exactly. shop. Right. Uh, so I, I think any of those three, well. you know, uh, uh, the bagel shop has those two uh, uh, little seats, wrought outside. iron seats yeah, out front. Right. Yeah. What about? I'm just going to throw this. I mean, from a, a street standpoint, when I was thinking about this last night, if we closed, if we could, Bird Street. <laughs> There's enough ways to get a wrap like that. If we did that whole street right there, you know. For whose benefit? For what? <laughs> but that's that's only Union Straw would benefit from that. Well, and because I forgot the house of pizza moved. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, I did <laughs> speak to Chief Grace today. Yeah, what, what is his And thoughts? I kind of bounced that off him about Central Street. And okay. He said that it'd be something he'd entertain. Closing the street off? Closing the street off for a designated amount of time on a few nights, Friday night, Saturday night. So just be pedestrian traffic. Right, right, because we've got Liberty, we've got Wall Street, we can circumvent very easily. That's a good idea. And it would allow, you know, what people in, that are very restricted in that area to get some relief as well. But that can only happen after a rush hour, because it's one rule. Right, one but if you do yes. six to nine, Gary. Yeah. There is no rush hour right now. <laughs> well, if you've been it's, on, it's, it's getting more busier. More. It is getting busier. Yeah, it's getting it busier. It is, yes. I'm Sorry. down on to 80 miles an hour now on 495. So it's <laughs> speed oh it's picking up. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, I mean, I think I'd like to open it up to the, the other people who've been patiently waiting to give their points of view on this. If you want to raise your hand or something and we'll recognize you and you can tell us what you think or what you're concerned about or whatever was that was that fist a raised hand <laughs> no no he's frozen okay. please all right Go ahead, hey, everybody all right so um well a bunch of stuff here um she's cuter than eric so for um the board of health point of view I'm uh, just spitballing here. This is uh, all preliminary. First of all, we're, what Paige is trying to do, uh, what, what everyone's trying to do here is 
get ready. So when the governor says go, we don't have to sit in these meetings and try to figure out how we're going to do it. So we're sort of ready to go. What what does the town want? What would it look like? What's the Board of Health want? What does the police department want? It's stuff like that. And how would it look like? And I don't know, whenever you put it out there, maybe people will start thinking about, oh, we're talking about this. How would it work at my facility? Um, somebody, I think it was Kevin, brought up the equity issue. So as soon as you say one place, the pizza place or the or the bagel place, everybody is going to want in on it. Of course. We're all going to want approval. And we only have a month or two or three that we're going to be operating this. So, you know, I could just see that we're going to have to have a plan, some kind of a checklist, how many people, what's the capacity, what's the egress, what's the access, um, you know, who's going to approve that? You know, so it's almost like, you know, we have to have bathroom facilities. All right. So how's that going to look? You know, for, so for the Board of Health, we're almost going to have to review every single one of these for the safety issue, for the public health issue. We don't call it social distancing anymore. We call it safety, safe distancing, unless we're socializing. But safe distancing, so everyone, even the sidewalk people, how far away are they from the sidewalk? Or, you know, some people walk walking by. Um, and then we have other issues, and I'm not saying these are insurmountable, but yeah. things, you know, you can't have picnic tables. Well, you can't have wooden picnic tables, you know, because you would need to sanitize and you need to, uh, you know, be able to uh, sterilize, sterilize, and, and you, you know all that stuff. Um, so you know, and procedures, you know, everyone's big into procedures, you know. And then again, it's nice to, for us to be able to help out our downtown people. I just foresee that. Uh, you know, everybody up at Gillette is going to want, Patriot Place is going to want to do it as well. So there we go into the equity issue, and then it's just going to be large scale. You know, they already have blocked off roads, you know, so they don't need to, they could just set up everywhere. And so it's, you know, but again, everyone's going to want it to be today or tomorrow. Um, there's a whole bunch, maybe, I don't even know, Paige, do we have like a checklist from other towns? Like what did Norwood do or what did, you know, how did they approve it? Did they just say, go for it? Or, you know, who approved, you know, you said one town, the the uh, town manager did it, but did he have a checklist or was it just like, yeah, I guess I feel good today. I'm gonna approve you. I don't know, you know what? <laughs> no, it, Eric, it did, um, the, we could do a checklist certainly. Um, and just so you know, Norwood did approve it um, earlier this week. Um, what it is, is there's a requirement for what has to be submitted and then that gets submitted and we do have to, so yeah, Board of Health is one of the sign offs. So the town manager wouldn't issue a permit until we each signed off on it. So, no, no, no. but I'm, I'm right. trying to be selfish here. Is there a form that I could copy to hand out to people that they could check off, you know, so that I could review the check off? You know what I mean? It's like, is there already some design or do we have to now start figuring out, okay, you know what can you do? What can you do? What you know? What are the checkoffs? That, that I'll, can... I'll make a I'll make a form. Cool. You, you know, I, I mean, I can I can track one down and we can revise it. And I I'm, we're glad to do that aspect. If you want to like review it, we're glad to right. do the legwork because we know you have so much going on. Right. Well, that's okay. But uh, so here and just you know for the for everybody else here, planning board, we don't care to. I, I just know we don't care to to get involved in what size fence and what color fence and you know and tent or no tent no we get that you know we just want to make sure that it's the 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 health related stuff and right. we want to right. keep it very focused on that you know so you know how we do the safe distancing and sanitizing and and bathrooms and things like that eric uh, has pauline developed a checklist for more conventional internal phased in reopenings yeah, we're working on that. Okay. Yes, we are. We're working on that right now. Uh, again, it's it's uh, getting ready for when when uh, they say go. You know, when 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 uh, the governor says okay, go. So it's, we don't have to develop it. Yes, we're working on that. Right. And Eric, that is our intention as well. That 
we are trying to get ready for when the governor says go and you and I did speak about this last week and we are trying to put together a plan to bring to you right we're still on the same page that we were last week we just right and everything is going to work yeah it's just you know how do we how do we actually do it as Jeff said you know within within weeks not months you know and then sure. and then one other issue is I heard there was one group that was looking to institute a um, more permanent structure or facility and I'm wondering how that's going to work uh, you know given that um, you know it, I don't know how how the planning board has to go you know I mean maybe we do a temporary and then we morph into the into the permanent so I don't that, know. That, that is it's going to come up for discussion after this Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I see Jimmy there and Travis, and yeah, I see those guys. Yeah. yeah that's right. our next, that's <laughs> our next agenda. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So I just have a few few thoughts. If if, if it's okay, this is Jimmy Brown from Union First, I think it's really impressive that you're you're doing this proactively. It's such a I a needed and necessary step to get us in a place where we can actually start to recoup some of our losses, keep the business moving forward. Um, I just want to share some of my experience in terms of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in the sense of drug development. I don't think we're going to have all the answers. There's going to be a, a learning curve associated to everything that we do in, in my day-to-day. -day, we're dealing with the FDA. We're dealing with clinical trials, putting medicine into patients. And the speed at what the federal government has moved at is, is never seen before, but you're learning on the fly. So I think as long as we can prepare and get ourselves set up, to be able to go when the governor says go and not start the planning at that point. We can always work collaboratively to make sure that as things come up, we are addressing them on the fly. And I think most restaurants would do that. Um, for us, the biggest concern out of um, the things I heard, and there's, there weren't many, is the time it takes to get the approval. I think um, that was brought up. And, and for us, being able to actually start serving patrons and our local you know, guests and customers immediately is is critical for, for our business, but also I think just critical for morale in town and the community. Um, and then the other piece that I would that I would just want us to all sort of think about as we as we think about this. I know we're trying to think of stage one, stage two, and um, you know, making sure everybody has the opportunity. So I, I fully and we all are fully agreeing on that everybody should have the opportunity to open in this temporary environment. But I just don't want us to slow down tier one because we want to figure out tier two and three. And we're we're all for being a part of the process. So if there's anything that we can do to be a part of the discussion, come in for planning meetings, participate with you know the the push for for state and, and um, state government sort of approvals if we need more backing from local restaurants, um, we're here to support that. But but those are, are my primary thoughts and considerations or, or concerns associated to the plan that I just heard. But in general, huge you know fan of it. Really excited about the opportunity to be able to open our doors again and anything we can do to help in the decision. You know we're all game on this. So. Yeah, just so you understand, when, when I made when I brought that point up, it wasn't so much to slow down the tier one thing. It was more like to drag the tier thing two thing forward, <laughs> oh, yeah. more, more quickly. Yeah. So, Are we. I, I have a question. Are we say we want to do this, but the governor hasn't issued an executive order. What are the cheap? Can we do it or no? The governor has to do something in order for us well, to I be think, I, think, I think the governor has to tell right. all the towns in the Commonwealth, okay. you can now open a salon. You can now open a restaurant. No, I, I mean as the a, outdoor dining. No, thing. I know. But I'm just saying as a general rule, I mean, I think that I don't know that he has to. I'm not sure whether he's going to make an executive order about location of the dining. Mm -hmm. He's going to do it in terms of the number of people, isn't he? And in fact, I understand. I think it's going to be just blanket yeah. on said date okay. restaurant so if, maybe ten, if your town decides okay we'll allow that to be on an outside basis as long as he's as long as we meet the <clears throat> parameter of 25 percent or 50 percent gotcha. okay. i don't think he's going to care you don't and think they follow rhode island's lead because rhode island opened outdoor dining first yes they did right. and they then did. they went to indoor quickly 
too. They did. But in yeah. terms of just yeah. getting yeah. people yeah. back in dining, I mean, as Eric said, we have plenty of places uh, up on Route 1 that have outdoor dining as part of their normal course of business. Right. So, I mean, that's just a natural, mm -hmm. and they're already permitted for that. Yes. That, I think what we're talking about here is a little bit different. It is. You know, right. I agree. There will be some spillover up there because they're going to try to gain seating capacity as well. And, right. You know, that's the, that's the idea behind this entire thing is to give the restaurants the seating, the ability to fill more than the 25% that the governor is allowing at this point by, going, by getting outside. Well, hold on a sec. I thought that, in, unless I misunderstood, I thought well, that it wasn't an addition to what the threshold would be that it would be combined. Is that correct, Paige, the way you've written this here? Well, I'm, when I say the number of seats, it has to do with the zoning. So like we issue a permit for say Union Straw, I can't even remember the seat. Well, let's just say it's 100 seats and the governor says I'm opening it up to 25%, then there's gonna be 25 seats combined between inside and outside. Is that right? Um, Maybe I, I'm not getting into that. Where thing is talking more about zoning. Like I, my my language in there has to do with the fact that you could never have more than the eighty five, the hundred seats, only because that's what the that. place was designed for. So, so. Right. yeah, we can't represent the 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 board of, the the state anyway. So we're just talking more about zoning and making sure we don't go over the number that was originally permitted. Well, I but do I, think that's an important consideration, right, and I, I'm I, not saying one way or the other, yeah. but it's got to be clear. I get what you're saying. If if some place can have 180, and the governor and the governor says, "Well, 50% capacity. It's 90 between inside and outside." That's what I that's thought right. this was. That's how I read it as well. But other states, I believe, they're only referring to capacity inside. limits for inside. Yes, there's no yeah. limit to the exterior as long as you we have. We need to get clarification. Yeah, yeah we're going to have to get clarification on that. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, this won't come on our bylaw. Right. I mean, our regulation, because that is all regulated at the like the Board of Health wouldn't be able to issue a permit for greater than the governor allowed. So that would not be right. something that could follow through. So it would have to be if, by example, if 50 percent is what the governor allows, it's combined. Not, it's combined. It's your total outside. occupancy. Yeah. Total if, the, the outside, if yeah. he's restricting outdoor dining, but like Gary said, he might not be restricting outdoor dining. We don't know. Right. So we'll have to find that out. <clears throat> yeah, so and I mentioned two other that I was thinking. One is um, with the with the rumor of potential June six, June eighth um, sort of guidance for phase two kicking in. Again, we don't know where Governor Baker is going to go with the announcement around restaurants. Um, I think someone already mentioned it. The board only meets every two weeks. Um, I mean, so I mean, obviously for us, I mean, we, we 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 hope to hear that this is approved as quickly as possible, so that we could start planning. Because a big part for this, and I, I think I speak on behalf of all, strong that had to you know, kind of pull off and and do the unfortunate part of of what this pandemic's situation put us in. We have to ramp up the hire. We have to make sure we're we're ready and and to go and everybody's trained to the new guidances around sanitation. So, you know, we're, we're reading everything around other states, temperature taking, thermometers, everything associated to the various, you know, health, um, you know, health risks that we have. And so for us, I mean, and you know, the sooner the better so that we could just start planning, ramping up. And I'm, I'm sure that's, that's the sentiment for most restaurants. And then the, the second piece that I had left or was, the length and duration of the temporary permit. Um, I don't think any of us know when this is going to end. We, we certainly know that the weather is nice all the way until October, November. I'm not saying, you know, give us in perpetuity temporary permit for outside, but I just caution putting it, you know, I mean, obviously things can change. You can adjust your time, but putting a hard stop in September could be a challenge, especially if there's wave two or spike, you never know what's going to happen. So I just think it's something where Putting that short duration, um, you know, it might be a, you know something just to explore a little bit. Uh, just just a quick one um, on what you're saying as far as um, uh, Board of Health. Board of Health has uh, two meetings uh, a week with uh, DPH and with DLS with the labor, um, and uh, one of the big complaints is that we. Um, we're talking to and asking, could we find out about all this stuff before 
you were announcing it on TV because before they, they're finishing announcing it, they're calling the Board of Health and saying, okay, can I open it? We have no, we have no plans. We have no knowledge of any of this. So we're asking for as much lead time on all this so we can develop all these plans so that when the phone rings 15 minutes or halfway through his speech, we can react and we know, we know what we're talking about. So believe me, that is one of the things that we're asking. Give us as much notice as we can. As soon as we know all this, we're going to be better like that. You know, Paige, you have in your guidance uh, six feet, you know, uh, seating six feet. Well, we don't know. Maybe it's eight feet. Maybe it's 10 feet. Maybe it's, we don't know yet. So we'd just like to know that stuff up front so we can guide you because if we don't no, know we, the answer, if we don't know the question, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, so. no, I fully agree for us that the outside of the, you know, we can always move tables around. We can always spread people and how to sit it. We can, we will abide by all the, the guidances that are put out there and we'll work, you know, hand in, in hand with you and the board of health to make sure we're doing everything correctly. I think the bigger concern for us is can we get ramped up fast enough? If all of a sudden the decision comes June 6th and you can start June 6th and we haven't made a decision until June 11th about the temporary permitting here in town. So then by then we've already lost however much time it takes to actually build out a, a site plan, get the materials in, get the heaters, obviously not under a tent. I heard that loud and clear, but you know, it gets warm people up. But for us, there's, and I'm not saying there isn't on your end either to try to make the right decision. There's a, uh, a laundry list about 16 pages long that we need to start ticking off as soon as we know we can start, um, start the, you know, to serve outside once we get the green light. The other piece though, is we're going to do some stuff at risk in general in terms of the planning activity on our side. That's just us as being good business and proactive business owners. But I mean, the more we have an understanding that this is go through, you know, the fact more investment we can put into getting ready. And I speak on just, I don't speak for all restaurants, but I think most would feel the same way. No, please. Leave. Leave. Thank you. Um, so I know we've been talking about this for a while, so I'll, I'll be brief, but I think what we're doing here tonight is really important to try to get ahead of this stuff. Um, it's great how so many groups have kind of come together to come up with this first draft. So thank you, Paige. Um, you know, I think like some of the other topics that have come up tonight, though, you know, we could have 10 meetings and debate a lot of this stuff, you know, probably until November to come up with regulations, <laughs> but we need to, you know, come up with, with some, some rules that, that will provide for you know, so we don't have bedlam, but also so that it's easy for restaurants to implement. So, you know, as I think about that approval process, you know, Mr. Arvidon, well, you guys may be meeting twice a week, you know, the board of selectmen just met Tuesday planning boards meeting today, you know, we're not meeting again for two weeks. So we need to be able to streamline those, those approvals as much as we can. Um, and, you know, what does next steps look, look like from here? Um, so this is an informal discussion. Are we looking at another two weeks to have a formal discussion and then a decision? Um, I know this is new to everyone and we may not know the answers, but, you know, Paige, you know, Doc, Kevin, kind of what do you guys think this looks like from here forward, next step? Well, I, I mean, just speaking per personally, I mean, I think that um, if we can get to, you, you know, to combine some of the things we talked about tonight, like Eric saying, is there a checkoff list? And there's probably has to be multiple checkoff lists so that, or just one master list so that, the Board of Health can do their check, Chief Grace can do his check, Fire Department can do their check, and, and um, if, as long as everybody's already licensed for a victor's license, then if the selectmen are willing to do it, I, I like Doc's idea, let, let Bill give the final sign off and let them go. Kevin, towards that end and towards Leah's uh, question, so would we then consider this document if modified or whatever? administrative in nature so what would be the enactment process to adopt this i don't know um, page do you think well, we even do we need a public hearing for that or what i'm gonna say no i mean we're winging it here we watched uh lee and i i got only 10 some of it but we watched the board of selectmen um, North, down in Norwood, they met at 1.30 in the afternoon, um, what was it, Wednesday or something. You know, we're going to have to move fast. I think that there might need to be extra meetings, you know, even if it's just Zoom meetings where people Zoom in. Um, perhaps tonight, I mean, 
to, to Eric's point and Kevin, what you just said, I think something like a checklist can be handled after the fact. That's not something, we're not gonna have those answers. I mean, that's one of those things that we're gonna have to roll, like Eric said, the six foot, eight foot, 10 foot separation. Yeah. We don't know what the governor's come, gonna come down with. We can come up with a checklist now of sort of like what information the Board of Health is gonna need, but until we know what's gonna be required, we can't really stipulate it. So, but we can sort of outline, and I will certainly get going on that right away. But I don't think we need to just like hold up on that. I think what we can look at here is our general requirements. Do you feel that the general requirements that are outlined here are going to adequately protect the community as we move rather expeditiously on this? Um, and I think if, if you know you have the board, you have three members of the board of selectmen here, you have the planning board here. I mean, I know we can't take a formal vote, but we could certainly, I think, get it to the point where the next meeting you publicize it maybe have a joint meeting. I don't know the best way. It's kind of a little bit of uncharted territory, but I'd like to get this like, I don't think we should wait till the next meeting. Whether is that June 9th? I think I that agree. might be something you need to do sooner because that that's too late. So have to jettison. As far as the Board of Health goes, Board of Health, we don't sleep. We're, we, we have it set up, so we're just, we're always, uh, we're able to approve stuff as we fly every day, so. You know, we don't need board approval. Uh, okay. We got health health department, so we're ready to go. Uh, yeah, and that, that meeting we watched for Norwood Page, um, you know, they definitely don't normally meet on a Tuesday after a holiday at 1.30. That was like, it, it seemed like it was a quick, you know, Zoom meeting. Everything had kind of been buttoned up at that point. They had a couple other things on the agenda to kind of tick off as well. But I think that um, the planning board and the board of selectmen will have to be flexible yeah. to possibly gather, mm -hmm. you know, quickly and out of our normal schedule to just. Okay. Yeah, there's, Please there's, stop. yeah, there's two points I want to bring up. Uh, one, I think when the governor Baker makes his announcement on the 8th, it's going to be for a date, four or five or a week down the road, sort of like phase one. Talked about phase one, but wasn't really implemented for a few days down the road. So I think we'll have a few days anyway to at least grasp what he said. The other thing is um, we can have emergency meetings, the, the, the Board of Selectmen. Uh, we need 48 hours notice uh, and, we, and we can meet. We can meet Zoom, we can meet here, we can meet up at Bill's office. So uh, that's, that's not a problem, but we might not know a lot until the 8th anyway. But I think this is a guideline. I, I don't think we have to approve it per se. I think it's a great guideline going forward. Well, I, I, Doc, I think it would be helpful. I think this Board of Selectmen probably should adopt it. And, um, you know, I think even if we had to, like, take out the Tier 2 right now um, and, and with a commitment to get it, you know, addended onto there, you know, within a week or two so that because we want to make everything fair. But, you know, if, if that's something that we think will hold up this approval process for Tier 1, I, I'm suggesting maybe we – you know, we tonight try to figure out if there's any issues that people have that we should be figuring out how to fix. And if not, let's try to get this in a form where, you know, the, the selectmen can approve it, even if it were next week, you know, I mean, because this is really just general guidelines. The specifics of, of hygiene and all layout and everything are really going to come from the state. But I think a lot of these are very basic you know talking about business owners signing off and and you know no seating i mean these aren't things that are going to really change by what the governor says so i think these are kind of your basic best management practices and then the governor's input will sort of be the final rule and go from there so are you are you suggesting that we potentially take an informal or get a sense of does the this board endorse it you like a straw poll like a straw poll, a straw poll. and then right you know the thing that scares me is you're not meeting for two weeks so well i just uh you said three I board members i only saw leah but chris did text me that he's listening in yeah, also. he's right there he's right there he's there bottom well there you are sorry about that <laughs> i didn't even see you um so we could potentially um uh, well i guess chris you said we we should open our meeting officially we're gonna have to yeah, we have a quorum, Doc. We got to open our meeting. Okay, so uh, I move to open our meeting. Second. 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 All right. All those in favor? All right. Uh, okay, we're open now. So we could potentially do a little bit more now than I thought. I, I, I didn't recognize Chris. Right. So can I just ask a quick question? 
is is it possible that the selectmen could conceptually agree that something you know whatever the details are you know we all agree you know i would say the board of health will agree to work towards this uh, whatever it's going to look like you know whether it's you know it's got 17 dots you know like page or 13 or or we changed the six to a nine you know but conceptually the selectmen are in agreement with moving forward with a plan oh you know, and you're not going to get it you're not going to get in and figure out what the board of health is going to do and i'm not going to figure out what the planning board but but you know, conceptually, you say yes. I think this is a good plan. Let's move forward. However, it looks, you know, and that, and that that way, now at least it gives the restaurants. You know, okay, we know everybody's on board. Let's, you know, we don't know what it's going to look like, but we're all working together so we can give them as much, you know, leeway as as we can. And then when the governor says the eighth or the eleventh, or we're moving it to the fifteenth, whatever, you know, I don't know. At least we'll know that that's what we're working towards, you know, as much transparency as we can. You I know, think conceptually, uh, Leah, Chris, if you want to um, weigh in, I I'm in favor. Yeah, I think um, conceptually, overall, I'm in favor. The document is in a very rough form. There's um, some things that, Paige, I can get with you tomorrow that um, if you start reading it, everything says temporary, temporary, temporary. And halfway through the document that where temporary is gone so it's a little confusing mm -hmm. um i think the tier one no-brainer easy to do tier two i think is going to take a little bit longer where we're dealing with you know closing streets sidewalks municipal parking um i think we definitely need to get town council involved um if they haven't been already so but uh tier one definitely uh, i don't think the board would have any issue with proceeding uh, to try to figure out the best way to do it. Right. And, and just one other thought, um, you know, when, when we get approval from the um, Stadium Advisory Committee, um, it's sort of a similar process. It has to go through police, it has to go through fire. Um, you know, there's a checklist that everybody checks off uh, before we approve a concert or the Patriots game. So I don't know if Chief Grace has a uh, form that uh, uh, um, you could use, Paige, but everything's checked off when we get it, when, when we get it. Uh, Leah, your thought conceptually, are you good? I am completely in um, in support conceptually. You know, like Chris said, I, I might have a couple minor things, and if anything, my changes are things that might make it a little bit less red tape. You know, like the the heaters, for example, if it goes into the fall, just you know, really minor things like that. But I would absolutely entertain, like Tracy said, like some kind of straw poll or something tonight to at least get this moving, given the circumstances and the kind of fast pace that we have to live by right now. Well, that, that's us. How about you guys? I'm in support of it. Yeah, absolutely. I would just say, you know, the um, whole issue of that tier two part, Chris, you know, what you were talking about is um, I, I just don't, I, I'm not sure. I, I got the sense that you were trying to say that we could work on that and bring it back in and kind of tweak it, blah, blah, blah. But I just don't see any kind of convention. And I'm the last one who would ever suggest that we not follow proper public hearing type procedures and timelines, I just don't think that's going to work in this situation. So the way I'm looking at the way this is talked about, that's not spelled out in the town manager sort of streamlined process. It's only in that second part where the Board of Selectmen is involved in taking a formal vote on these applications beyond the administrative level that you start talking about public hearing, advertising, two weeks, n none of that stuff is really gonna work uh, in this case. So, you know, maybe maybe for a, if we were to look at a sort of permanent slash temporary approval, you know, temporary outdoor seating, but this is gonna reside with us on a permanent basis going forward in years to come, yeah, that would make sense. Do you understand what I'm saying, Doc? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think phase two uh, or, or tier two was more sidewalks, uh, public parking I understand lots. Okay, okay, I just want to make sure. That. I'm looking Wait. more at the timelines of from the, the date that someone wants to file an 
an application. How long is it going to take to go through that process to get an approval or a decision one way or the other? And right now, it's going to it's going to take a while. Yeah. And that's something. Can that I, I ask have... ask a question of the age of the planning board? Uh, obviously, by looking at the agenda, Union Straw wants to do some sort of an outdoor um, area. Yes. Other than that, how many restaurants have come forward and say, hey, we're interested in doing this? Um, today we got an email from the 99 and I know the craft group folks, you know, of course, they're pre set up. And that's I should say that's a big part of this, too, is to make sure that the little guys yeah, can compete with the big guys. Um, you know, that's something we're always looking for equity there. Um, so, yeah, really, Patriot Place is set up for this. Granted, they mm -hmm. do need to get additional permits, but um, so I know they're interested and um, 99. I'm not sure. I haven't heard from anybody else yet. All right. I wasn't just I wasn't sure if we were, you know, trying to rush through this and there's, there's really not a need because there will be a, a significant cost to anybody doing this. And it could be it could be a perm, uh, not permanent, but it could last through the fall or who knows, in September, things could go back to normal, hopefully. Um, OK. I think we also just need to consider too, you know, we have our own restaurants in town to think about and competition in town, but you know, other towns are moving fast on this. Like Norwood is closing down the whole street in front of the theater um, Friday through Sunday to have, um, what do they call it? Like weekends on Central. So, you know, people are gonna be going to other towns. So we need to think of equity, you know, among people choosing to go to Rhode Island, people choosing to go just up the road to Norwood. So. You know, if if you'd entertain it, Doc, I could make a motion on behalf of the Board of Selectmen tonight, um, you know, to kind of kind of move things along. Uh, absolutely. <clears throat> if okay. I may um, put in my two cents on this. Please. Um, collectively, we spent a lot of time over the last week trying to get some sort of a format, nothing formal at this point, because there's too many moving parts. But I strongly feel that we need to be able to convey the message out to the restaurants and the community that we're on their side, that we need to help them with this. And I think that's what we're working towards at this point. There's still a lot of work to be done, absolutely. All right, so with that, um, the Board of Selectmen makes a motion to informally adopt the temporary outdoor dining areas as proposed with you know a few components still to be worked through, but to approve it conceptually. Chris? I get a second. Um, well, I'll get a second for discussion. All right, Doc seconded. So with with what you're saying, Leah, um, this plan as written with tier one and tier two, or are we going to try to just go with tier one? I mean, I think that we have to work that out. I don't think that tier two works with public hearings and waiting for meetings. And I, I don't think it's fair to people you know like like sam and others that don't have their own private space so you know i think we need to look more at what cities like norwood and falmouth and other towns are doing um you know to maybe have some kind of umbrella that you're allowed to use you know the five feet of the 10 feet of sidewalk or something or i think we have to come up with something that that helps those those groups i just don't know what that is yet so i think tier one good to go i think tier two is where we just need a little bit more discussion Okay, so as far as like a formal vote, I mean, I didn't thought we were just kind of taking a straw poll. I think the three of us, Doc, you and I, are totally in favor of this moving it forward to the next level. Um, but I think then, I don't think the I think the planning board needs to vote officially on I think the finished document because this is not a finished document at all. Um, but I think conceptually, everybody's in favor of moving this quickly to the next level. So I don't know if we really need a, an official vote to adopt this. Um, I, you don't, order, don't want to adopt this. Well, <laughs> I, but I think, no, I, think no, we, exactly. I think to Ron's point, we're, we want to send an indication to the restaurant owners in town that we are, we're, we're gonna do as much as we can, as quickly as we can to, to make this happen, but that's within our purview. So I do think an informal type of vote of support Maybe it's not voting on this official document because I know there's you know a lot of tweaking, but you know uh, that might be the right way to go. Yeah, I can amend my motion to just conceptually um, support. You know, move, move forward to support the temporary outdoor dining area uh, with the details to be you know kind of worked out. Maybe next time it comes to us, it's approved by the planning board, and then we're just 
you know, stamping it like Norwood did in, in a quick meeting on a, a random weekday, whenever it's all set to go. All right, so I'll second the motion that you just made. Did uh, one of you guys write that down? I forgot to. Didn't think to. Although it's, uh, it's on uh, recorded. We have pre-recorded, so we're good. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Good, all right, so we're good, conceptually. Uh, I'll make a motion for the planning board to uh, officially support the out, the concept of outdoor dining with the details to be worked out. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I can't vote. Oh, you can't vote? True. That'll change shortly. Switch seats. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I say one shortly. thing? Yeah. Uh, regarding process um, moving forward. So, I don't know. I mean, I know you're saying that the planning board needs to approve it before. I mean, it really isn't a clear process. I mean, we could even do something like another joint meeting in like a week where with the hope where we get this all refined to the extent it's, it's not going to be final until we see what the governor does. But, he, but I'm trying to create something that kind of is final regardless of what the governor does. So that's my goal. But I'm just trying to keep next week is June 4th. Um, so we're already at June 4th, you know, the board of selectmen meet June 9th. I would love to get this on the books before June 9th, you know, preferably sometime next week. So I wonder if we don't go back to the drawing board, I try to submit something early next week and maybe we try to have another meeting quick, even if it's in the, whenever people can do it, where we try mm -hmm. to flesh this yeah. out, we advertise it a little more and we try to get this taken care of next week. Maybe like even June 2nd, like yeah. early mid next week. Yeah, and I, I agree with Leah. Possibly I mean, we'll pull to ourselves together, you know, to get this moving. We don't have to wait yeah, two no weeks. Yep. Um, Paige, you, I mean, we're looking at maybe Tuesday the 2nd. Do you think you could uh, uh, fine tune the. Um, we would have to post uh, by. We'd have to post Friday. by Friday. Tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. You'd have to. Right. I'm not available Tuesday night. That's my only problem. Thursday. I'm available during the day. I mean, I think most of us, I, Doc, I don't know if you are, but Tuesday I can make during myself. The day, I'm good. Available. You're not available at all, Paige, Tuesday? Uh, well, no, I'm available Tuesday, but I'm not available from 6 p.m. on. I Will like you be ready to go meetings. if we were to meet Tuesday during the day, in the afternoon? Would you all have this ready? If I can get, yeah. I mean, a Tuesday's gonna be a challenge. I will, because I mean, I have to get Wednesday something. During the day. Wednesday. How about Wednesday during the day? That would be great for me. Oh, see, now that messes me up. How about Wednesday night? Yep, fine. Well, where can we do it? Because it is an ADCOM meeting. Well, we can all just do Zoom. Yeah, is everyone comfortable Perfect. With that? Why don't we do Wednesday night? That works for me. For you? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Works for us. Would that be the first meeting of a town board exclusively on Zoom that's not being run through cable? For this community, I oh, believe God so. Oh, God help us. So too. <laughs> Is that we can figure it out. Norwood did it. Hold on. <laughs> Most towns aren't you know, even coming in in person. Comes having their I, no and I think barred. we would want to work, I'm sorry, but I think we would want to work through cable only because I really think it's a great idea to have this going out through cable access. Thursday night. You know, and let the, let the public see what's going on. It's to be Thursday. 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 We'll have Thursday. to do Thursday night. Yeah. Thursday night then. Because ADCOM has their last meeting on Wednesday. And it's going to go through, it's going to go through Mike, right. I think. I have a, we have a housing meeting at 6 p.m. on Thursday night. That's my problem. Blow them off. Uh, I think this needs to take precedent. Yeah. <laughs> can we change the housing meeting? I can't. Meeting? I'm sorry. I, I can't. I can't skip that one. But can we do it earlier? Can you change, can you change the meeting though? Can you change the housing meeting to a different day? Not how, really. How long yeah, is housing going to be? It's for till 7:30. I could. We could do 7:30 maybe. Or do, why don't we do five? What, what time, time does it start? Six. Six. So let's just. What time, time does that come start? 7:30. 7:30 on Thursday. Ad comp shouldn't yeah. be long, but no. I but I'm saying if we come in before them, maybe we can talk you to Mike. Mike, <laughs> could we sneak in before Adcom? Yeah. How about Wednesday before Adcom? What time did they come in, Mike? Seven. <laughs> Why don't we do Wednesday at five? Again, I, I couldn't get there till six. 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 Uh, is it, it shouldn't take longer than an hour. Okay, how about Wednesday at 6? Going once. Everybody okay with Wednesday at 6? I need a gavel. 
I will make myself available whenever, when, whenever. Ditto. All right. Okay. Does that work? Six. Wednesday at six. Okay. Yep. Great. All right. All right. I thank uh, you all. Uh, move to close the uh, board of selectmen meeting. Second. All those in favor? All right. Good. Wednesday six. So while uh, I'll call our people and. Let them know to post Your people it. call our people. Yeah. Our people, yeah. yeah. You people. <laughs> I don't know how to post it. Next agenda <laughs> I know. item. We're only, thank you, uh, everyone. We're only thank two you hours are. late on the next agenda right. item. Thank you. Great job. Well, we're an hour, 10 minutes. No, 745. Yeah, it's 8. 8.55. Okay, whatever. Thanks, Chris and Leah. So, um, it being sometime past 745, we have another informal discussion for Union Straw to discuss, to discuss a request for an outdoor patio to be located at the front of the building at 8 Mechanic Street. So we know you submitted a couple of series of drawings. And um, we know that there's been some internal discussion. Um, I believe Paige may have had some conversation with I'm not sure. Did you have a conversation with building? With, I did. Uh, with Bill? Yes. Page? Today. Do you want to speak um, that? was in addition. <laughs> yeah. or, or do you want to let them make the proposal well, before you speak about that? Well, yeah, I think, well, first of all, let me just back up and clarify that what's interesting about this one is, um, and it might be confusing to people catching up, is this is slightly different than what we were just talking about. Um, because it's the what's being proposed right now at Union Straw would be a permanent outdoor dining facility. So that's why, just want to clarify why this is a different nuance. Um, and again, they are seeking a fast track for obvious reasons. Um, we did take a look at the original plan submitted and being that was over a thousand square feet, it would trigger site plan review. As we've discovered, site plan review, it just takes too long in this process. It would probably take about a month and that's just time that, that the restaurants don't have. Um, by bringing the, the um, land disturbance area Perfect. to 1,000 feet or less, it does not trigger site, well, it does trigger site plan review, but the planning board has the ability to waive it. So you would have to waive it. Um, since that time, we've also today looked at um, lot coverage to ensure that there's a limitation of 85%. Um, the most recent thing that I emailed over to them right before, uh, I feel bad because I keep coming up with new problems. And, and again, we're trying to avoid problems, but we all know how zoning and regulations work. Um, there was a concern about the grease trap location and that um, if you put you know, impervious surface over that, they weren't so much worried about it being covered, but just that it would have to be cleaned at times and it might be disturbed. But that's something it sounded from the Board of Health that that's more of an at your own risk. As long as you can access it, um, it can be addressed. So um, I'll let the gentlemen explain what they're proposing. Um, but yes, we have been looking back and forth of it. It's been submitted to all the departments. It would have to go through Board of Health, obviously. Um, they're kind of their own entity, but generally speaking, um, it's gotten favorable responses from most of the departments that have commented on it. Excellent. No, thanks so much for that outline page. And thanks everybody for, for letting us participate and getting us on the agenda so quickly. Um, I'm happy because we're past time for you to just give us a stamp of approval and move on. I'm joking. Um, no, um, so in general, um, yeah, for the plan specifically around um, how we were going to reopen as we've been dealing with the, the situation, um, it became more and more apparent that outdoor dining and outdoor seating was going to be something that was going to be um, sort of taken precedent um, versus indoor and outside capacity. We did all the research associated to um, what was happening down in Texas, South Carolina, as they were opening before um, any other state. Um, and even as you see Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and, and, and other states around us start to open. Um, so for us, we, we quickly jumped into action around planning um, ourselves, not obviously um, starting the activity, um, developing what the plan would look like, working with our, our landlord uh, uh, around the plan and making sure that he's comfortable with it. And then also going back to um, plans where, um, to your point around the grease trap, um, at our own risk type of thing, but based on the papers, based on the discussions we had with the previous building inspector, Riccio, we were on the impression that this was always an option for us to potentially uh, build out there on the front. Um, so we um, got over the plans as quickly as possible. 
example. And one of the things that um, we got in immediate feedback, and thank you, Paige, for facilitating and working well on this, was specifics around the process. So for us, um, we are going to do and continue to do everything as quickly as possible within the process. And that's why we second plan with 128 square feet so that we could uh, hopefully take advantage of that um, of paper for, this, for the zoning plan that you mentioned. Um, and then for us, obviously, based on <clears throat> as we earlier on around the need to act quickly and the need to start work to be able to capitalize on uh, on a true facility in the front. Obviously, I'll go into the project, answer the questions quickly, ensure that we work with you, the building director, as well as the board, um, regularly that we're meeting all the criteria as we're building this. Um, and, and I would say we've got a lot of experience in doing this with, with the town. Um, when we were opening Union Straw, I think one of the reasons why we were successful in getting it open the way we did was the constant communication with the town, the constant communication with the electric inspector, with with Nick, with yourself, um, and ultimately we would end to do the same exact thing on on this project as we start to um, hopefully get the green light to move forward and build and build this out and, and include this as part of our enhancement to not only our, our restaurant and our patrons but also to the downtown area and actually providing a much needed environment of um let's say some activity right out there on the it would be a nice addition um i think up and down. so so with that i'll pause i don't know if there are additional questions associated to that um but uh the two asks that we have um, here tonight number one is um the waiver for the site uh for the site plan i don't know how, what the process is specifically to be quite honest but we would love the opportunity to um to to get that waiver and number two is the approval to start move on this. Uh, I know there's more to be said around the actual final approval, but we have to be able to actually lock in our contractor, lock in our, our landscapers and start to work as quickly as possible for us to be able to capitalize. And I know that may sound hasty or knee jerk if it's in the sense of just jumping in on this, but for us, we think there is huge value for um, the community and then ultimately for us as a business as well. Um, to get on this as soon as possible, and that would also then open up our parking lot, alleviate the need for the per for the for the temporary, and allow for us to have the parking available as well. So, hey, so I'll, I'll pause. Do you want me to call in? Um. I agree with it all. <laughs> I do agree. I remember that there was a conversation with Nick about the outdoor dining area being coming permanent, you know, long before COVID ever came to pass. So I'm not surprised. Um, I don't blame them for wanting to, you know, rather than spending a lot of money on temporary, doing some, you know, spending probably a little bit more, but getting something that in the long run will um, continue to improve their facility. So, um, I don't have a problem with it. I, I think we can make this work. And um, it, much like what we just talked about, you know, it's almost a little bit of a leap of faith in some ways. But I think, you know, trusting our, our inspectors and, you know, we know the Board of Health is going to do a good job and the building department. I think we can get this done well and done quickly if the board is ready to move forward. So do we have a proposal that's going to allow them to do the to, to do the site plan waiver i mean is you know you know um yeah, we have submitted my knowledge um one of our other owners rob uh who works with us really really close to plan typically has submitted i think site plan waiver i'm sorry can you repeat that i didn't understand that oh sorry, oh, sorry. i'm asking some but these are extraordinary times. Can you try that again? Yeah, I don't I don't know. Know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Can we, uh, all, all screens are frozen or what? <laughs> no. no. It has no. been submitted. This is Travis Gassock. Could you we we can't hear you. We can't hear you very well. Hey, I, can you guys hear me? Can I make a, a Zoom suggestion since I'm on it all day at work? 
next to the mute button, if you if you use that arrow, you can say do switch to phone audio. And I would suggest the guys from Union Straw, if you can use that arrow and hit switch to phone audio, it will then dial you in. Thank you for the technical assistance. <laughs> use Zoom at work. <laughs> Where have you been all the past six weeks? <laughs> so see your mute button. That's where if you click oh, on that little arrow and that's okay now. It's better. Oh, so better, yeah. You yeah. didn't know that? That's oh, why you get that's, that's why you get the feedback. Oh. We we have have no, there's no there's no audio on you. We're not hearing you, Jimmy. And then once you do get on, Jimmy, you can't have your computer and phone audio on together, or else you'll get that feedback again. Short movie. <laughs> That's Leah. So while he, he's working on that, I will say I do think the board can, can, um, you know, you do have the ability to waive it since it's if it's it says for an, for, um, yeah, an, an alteration greater than a thousand square feet triggers it so as long as you are a thousand actually i don't even know if you need to waive it now that i'm just looking at it if it's below um, a thousand i don't think we have to waive it it's as long as it's below a thousand i don't think you need to take action so i think we're good so Sorry, that's I what i'm asking thinking. do we actually have a plan that's less than a thousand square feet starting with that well yes, sort of this is jimmy what's that sort of we have uh this <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, we do need to we do need to have a discussion about that. That is not technically a scaled plan, so you do need to give us something a little more right. specific than that. That says eleven hundred, and it says well, even this even thirty four by thirty four is more than a thousand square feet. Yes, right. it is. This is this is still more than a thousand square feet. But again, so this won't be a concern if as long as they're below a thousand, they can go through the building department. But it's over a thousand. I know, but I believe, guys, can you give me a thumbs up, Union Straw? You're planning on going to a, below a thousand for this to start, correct? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so they, they want to they want to say something, but yeah, to get this going, they want to start with a thousand so that they don't have to go through the whole public hearing process. And then was no, there no. Was, the, was there a question earlier about permeability? Got it. Thirty four. <laughs> Technology. Twenty nine by thirty four. There you go. So was it was there a question earlier about permeability that you were talking about, Paige? Not tonight, but earlier in the there process. There was. They're limited to 85. Can you, 85. Can you, hear, me? Sorry, Can you hear me now? Apologies for the technical difficulty. So, but Paige, there was a, at some point earlier in the process there was a question about permeability. Is that has that been resolved? Um, yeah, Bill Kasper, we believe they can use impervious pavers or other materials to ensure that it's not imp considered impervious. So pervious, they do, pervious. They pervious. do have to meet the 85% limitation of lot coverage, but we believe they can do so. And they're aware of that and they've committed to doing an imperv a, a pervious, pervious, sorry, impervious paver so that we're not creating, you know, 100% or 90% or impervious on the site. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Now we can hear you. Right. So yeah, we're at, we're at 928 square feet with the new design. Um, the one that you held up, yes. Um, although maybe shoddy handwork, it is the scale, and um, we did we did do it based on that, it, along with the actual outline of where the fence would be and the buffer between the fence and the sidewalk and the other barriers, along with the walkway between us and the uh, the business that's to our. If you're looking at it from mechanic to our right. Right. Um, yep. So. Um, for that, that is to scale. It's 928 square feet. We've come under it, and we would be using pervious pavers to um, to manage the risk that that was mentioned. Any questions? So really, this is an administrative application. This is an administrative thing. I know. Yeah. At this point. I mean, I would just say, generally speaking, you know, and, it, and I understand these are different circumstances, and, you know, obviously we just spent an hour trying to think of ways of encouraging and pushing forward uh, these types of programs at a difficult time. I do think at some point we have to have some standards in terms of what the oh, applications are going to be, you know. 
And especially, it'd be one thing if it was going to be one shot, temporary, you know, we're going to try and ride this thing out, you know, and whatever happens, happens. But something that's going to be there permanently, I think we're going to have some standards. Yeah, and I think just from our perspective, and I appreciate that feedback, we, we truly do. Um, if we do something more within our application, we're here. We will take the feedback. We're all about expediting and moving as quickly as we can through the process in the right way. We don't want, we're not looking for you to cut corners. We don't want to cut corners. Um, but we certainly want to move quickly, right? So um, I would say Paige has been tremendous in terms of providing feedback in real time with us, even on this phone call. So we appreciate that. Um, so whatever you need from us, we're willing and able to make sure we're amending the application in the right way. May I ask, so that um, you sent with the first application, there were some details on the fencing, um, which is that black wrought iron appearance fencing, I don't know, three or four feet tall, whatever. Is that your plan is four to feet. use four feet? Is that your plan to use that quality of fencing for that? Yes, it's commercial grade and it's um, also pretty tightly regulated for us to be able to serve liquor on the premise, which is also another whole process associated to this. You know, the building is obviously the first piece, but in, in parallel will be also um, going through the, the right process for the ABCCC to get our, our application to expand our liquor license and the fencing is a critical piece to that. And now was there, it looked like there was some concrete or cinder blocks or something um, tied in along the front. It was like a stone wall, but it, it, the, the, the code, it looked like it was actually cinder blocks. So do you have an uh, indication of the aesthetic well, of the wall good. that would be along mechanics? It was primarily to get us to grade. Okay. Based on, on having to um, put the, uh, the crushed gravel down to, to put the patio in. So it was it was to get us the grade and the fencing on top of that. Um, so quick. would you see an ugly cinder? Like what would the- No, uh, we, no it wouldn't be an, it, we got to get up to, but then we could put a facade around it. To make, okay. Make it um, I, have, I have a question because I was this way um, on King's building um, at the fire station. Somebody goes berserk on Mechanic Street and crashes into this thing. How much? I think this is a little different because you do have on street. You parking do have a long street, but on street parking, parking. There's a, there's and the sidewalk. sidewalk. Okay, okay. Sorry, I always. I, I think I like had a bad dream at one point in my life about somebody crashing into diners <laughs> somewhere. That's fire stations. Don't sit outside, Tracy. <laughs> Okay, right, there is on Tracy, you're not Tracy, you're not wrong. We actually had the same conversation today and we kind of walked through it and it was like, wait, there's a curbing, there's a sidewalk. So we kind of, so you weren't off the wall there. That very Thank good you. point to think about. <laughs> Thank you, considering Kevin was making fun of me. Oh. <laughs> um, so I just mention one thing. Some of you guys brought up, you know, the way it looks, the block wall, et cetera. Um, we're all Fox 4 residents. We're uber committed to this town. And I think everyone here, saw the final product of union straw you know we stand by what we it's all about the town so i think you'll be very happy and pleased how this is going to look it's important for us to look right we are prepared to make a significant investment not in union straw but in foxborough uh, so we want to we want to invest in uptown so this was kind of always something we thought was in our vision uh, but now it's become critical based on the situation we're in with COVID 19. Um, so we can kind of kill two birds with one stone. But it is a significant inv investment, and unfortunately, it is a time-sensitive investment uh, because of everything that has to line up the way it does with the contractors and materials in the process. That's why we're, and we're asking for this to be fast track. Okay. Should we just stay there? I think one thing I would add, too, is with our all permits, um, we always mention lighting, and that does is already on your permit um, for the parking area on the other side. I think the board would... You know, naturally, if there were concerns of lighting, using this out front, and I don't envision that, but that's something that I think the board would would say we have the right to go back and revisit that. You know, since there isn't a, a review process, and I know you guys are good neighbors, but that type of thing that you know, once it's up and running, we'd have to make sure that those types of things aren't a nuisance. Um, Absolutely. Just something that's in your letter, but just to kind of get it on the record, this has approval from um, your landlord. Your landlord written approval. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And is there a tree on site that would have to come down? No. Okay, good. We couldn't remember if there was a big, beautiful tree. But it, it won't be part of on the other side of the way. So listen, just, guys, just one aside. It, 
germane to uh, Jeff's point, and that is, I, I know you're in a rush to do this, and I know you think this is a scale drawing, and it is, but it's only an improvement of your previous back of napkin previous drawing. <laughs> so, you know, um, I just think that as we go forward, we'd like to see something that's a little bit more formal than that, like a real, uh, like not something you guys just put together on a piece of graph paper. And um, it's not that I don't think this, is, that the, this isn't important and it's not a rush, but I think that the history between the planning board and the restaurant has been when, been one where kind of at the last minute there's been a rush about something. The original rush was, oh gee, we don't need 90 seats, we need 122 seats. And we broke down the wall and just did that for you. So we support you. I happen to be a customer of your restaurant. I like your food. I think you guys are nice people, and I want to see you be successful. But I think that, you know, just the same way you want us to do things for you, we just expect you to do your best to try to be a part of the process when you can. Okay? Yeah, no, I fully appreciate the, the feedback. I think, you know, uh, we won't take the drawing remark as an insult in our penmanship, I assure you that. But uh, in general, for us, we think drawing, we, I will ask. We're out, of, we're out of time. And we lost. Well, and Weber left, so we're screwed. <laughs> no, he's right there. No, he's right there. So do we, ha do we have to vote on this? No. Paige, can you no, still hear us? If it's under, if it's under oh, a thousand square feet, he can just yep. go to Bill. We see you. Okay, we're back. I can hear you. Can you hear me? We see yeah. you. Yes. So okay. we don't have to vote on this. It just goes to Bill, correct? Correct. Yeah. Gabby, is that your understanding? Since it's a thousand feet or less, Gabby? Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, I believe that in the past we have voted, uh, the, the, the board has voted to waive uh, the side plan requirement. So I, I think it would be it would be great if you guys would uh, would vote on that. I'm only so, you know. I have one concern and I brought it up today as well. Which is? Um, if we're gonna be doing a permanent application here, yeah. and Jeff touched on it as well, we have no guidelines in place whatsoever. Uh, I would be more than comfortable in saying proceed with a temporary application, do your permanent plan, but do it on a temporary basis. Allow us the time to review and get some structure in place. You're the first guys coming forward and you're going to be setting the precedent for everybody else behind you. So I think that we need to, you know, a little give and take. We'll give you the authority to do what you need to do, but I would like to do it on a temporary for this point in time until we can get structure. And no, can you hear me okay? You're going in and out. Can you hear me okay? We can hear uh, you now. Hey, sorry, I just have to move it closer. No, and I appreciate that feedback. It's, you know, good collaboration and thinking on your, on your behalf too. Um, Um, our parking lot, but um, obviously we'd be investing further if we were to actually build the permanent one on, get the permanent approval on. So for us, I mean, we, we're all. F we're not hearing you. No, we lo keep losing We're you. losing you, Jimmy. Here, I, have, I have a question for Ron. Build without any inspection. Mm -hmm. Honest, can I put, can I just chime in? Because I really I'm just looking at the bylaw and I just really don't think we need to. Because the waivers we've done in the past, there's exemptions under 1054. It says for an addition of less than a thousand square feet to an existing building, the planning board may waive any or all of these requirements. That might be what we're thinking. But the section prior to that is 1053 applicability, and it says site plan review is required for. And then first is any new building, blah, blah, blah. But number two is any alteration of land greater than 1,000 square feet. So I think as long as they're below 1,000 square feet, it does not trigger site plan review in any way. So I'm just yeah. going to. Oh, I, I, I do agree with Paige now looking plan. at that. No, but I think yes. they, they don't. They, they can don't. just go to Bill right now and get signed off. Right. They, they don't, don't need us at all. They don't need us at all. No. no. I mean, right. technically, that's, that's how that, it's written. Kevin, isn't that the call of the zoning enforcement officer to make Yes. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, so, good so that's actually but I think we've given some good feedback. Call. I think this is important because we've been able to cover, you know, the fencing. I mean, I think even though it's it's quote unquote exempt. Now, gentlemen, we you broke up, and so we don't really know what 
were you ever going to go above a thousand now? Like, are you going to try to come in on phase two and go no. larger? Or are you going to live with the thousand? No. The nine twenty eight. Of a thousand. The nine twenty eight. Okay. Yeah, so I don't think the board needs to take action. I think we just need to, you know, ask them to work and make sure it's consistent with existing approvals and that the design aesthetic is, you know, a, a, an upgrade for Uptown. And I, I have no doubt that they will do that. Excellent. Well, so, up to the hold board. on, we didn't say anything. Here's, Jim. The, pro here's the problem. She doesn't get we, <laughs> well, hold on. Yeah, it's, it's up to us, not. Although I'm the decision maker now. Yay! I, mean, I don't think. I mean, I don't. Thank you. The bylaw is the bylaw. Right. 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 I mean, we're bent over backwards. We're done. What's we're that? done. We're bent over backwards. Yeah. But these are extraordinary times. Yeah, but I do think Kevin's point, Jimmy and Travis, is important. Um, this one, obviously, COVID is creating, driving the bus, driving the bus right. on this one, but just. Hurry up and ru you know rush rush rush. Just if we can follow, if you guys can follow the process, the next few times. Absolutely. All right. Do a good job. So, yeah. Go make it happen. Bye guys. It works. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Okay. Are we done? Is there anything else, Paige? Um. Gabby, I don't anything think so. from you? You both look very lovely this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, make a motion to adjourn. Second. Wait, I think Jeff has a point he'd like oh, to make. No, I don't. But I was just going to say, you know, you are absolutely right. It's, it's one thing to, to handle temporary or provisional applications in that manner. Exactly. But, but this isn't an application. This is a permanent. No, but it is a it is a permanent thing. It is. It's right on the bubble. You know, and I'm not saying, hey, I get it. You know, that's fine. No. But and I'm not saying. That and I would bet you're going to see forward. other stuff coming in. You know. Exactly. Great. But then, don't we have to change the bylaw? So it's you know, do we shrink the bylaw from no. a thousand down? No, but we no, just. But my my was a recommendation that they go with. The plan that they have, but on a temporary application. But if I'm a business owner and I'm going to invest money in all right? that, knowing what I would suggest, if you're going to do that, just me. just but spend the summer out in the parking lot, out in back, temporary meeting. while you're doing a permanent, you know. I would get their residents into doing that. Diana, would these approved previously? I would never go forward yeah, with something like yeah, this no, that's on a temporary right. basis. Can I just say one thing, Not guys? You know, this yeah. might. Bill Kasparis still might require more plans. You know what I mean? Like now that it's gone to his, we aren't sure that that plan is even going to suffice for Bill Kasparis. So right. just so you know, right. it, it's not the end like. of the road here. That was a conceptual thing. They literally submitted. Now we admit under the wire trying to like, they realized they were going to be stuck until June 11th if they didn't get something in. So, but we all know what Kevin's point is well taken, but just so you know, Bill still might require more in order to verify imperviouses and setbacks. It's, it's not necessarily over. Right. I'm pretty sure that he is, because I when I saw him uh, earlier this week, he was looking at the plans and he said that he was going to require a, a more um, a scale, a more detailed plan. He's a misnomer, I mean. <laughs> are we adjourned or are we still being? Somebody needs to second me. Second. He's got an oyster on his mind. <laughs> oh, I wish. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. Thanks, ladies. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.